It is indeed a pleasure to have this privilege to play here for you. And we, and we intend to give you a very fine program, so just settle back, relax, and enjoy the moment. 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 Mic check, mic check. <laughs> You know this gonna be a hellish morning because I'm chewing Big Red at 8 fucking a.m. and I just cursed at 8 or 1. Chewing Big Red. What up? What up, D? What up, Megzy? What's up, Whiskey Neat? Yeah, we got something for ya. Today, I'm excited. I'm excited. <clears throat> Already. <clears throat> Y'all would think I smoke or something. I don't. What's up, Hillary? Good to see you in the chat early this morning. Okay. So, boom. A lot going on today. The the fun part, the great part, the exciting part. <laughs> curse, curse, curse. I am. Today, today, um, today I'm leaning into just level 10. Level 10 meat. I'm telling you, I'm smacking this gum. Um, let me switch up real wait, 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 first. Let me do this. Boom. Bow. Let me switch up real quick. And then I'll come back. Good morning. Thank you for joining Mike Up with Mika Gadsden. I'm Mika Gadsden. Um, you know, uh, yeah, today we're going to have a great interview. I'm excited. Shout out to um, Beer Girl Meets World, um, a.k.a. Anna, who stopped by the live stream earlier this week. Uh, she mentioned this name when we were having a conversation. If you were able to watch that interview, uh, you may recall that she mentioned uh, Dave Infante. Um, I've covered some of Dave's pieces uh, here on like Mic'd Up. And so finally, um, definitely been excited and wanting to talk to Dave for a minute outside of him, his re reporting. Um, really want to dig in there. So I'm super excited. <laughs> I'm super excited to have Dave join us at 8.30 via Zoom. So you get to see Dave and Fonte. Um, Dave, as you can see by my stellar graphic, Dave is a two-time uh, James Beard award-winning journalist. Um, he currently writes for Vine Pair. We're going to learn about that because I, I don't know anything about it. Now, I don't, I don't like to Google before I do interviews. If I know someone, and then that's great. But if I don't know someone like that, like that, I don't like to Google. I like to learn with y'all. Um, just like I learned a lot of things about Anna, which y'all is the first time I've ever had a conversation with her. Um, Dave also has his own thing going on. All things fingers, fingers, podcast fingers, I guess, Substack. We'll get into that. He asked me like, so last night in our exchange, he was like, so, um, I, I sent him the email. The email had all the links to the, to the zoom. The, the email had like, Hey, these are things I want to touch on, blah, 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 blah. Right. And he was like, yo, can we talk about cycling? And I was like, head scratch. I don't. I, I follow his content, but I don't follow it like that. Um, so we're gonna talk about. He wants to talk about um, how the city is definitely not biker or pedestrian friendly. Let's talk about it. Um, and <laughs> he said he wanted to talk about Joe Cunningham, Joe Cunningham's uh, brewery strategy or brewery uh, <laughs> brewery shtick. I'm gonna call it a shtick. Um, but uh, we're gonna be very gentle, I guess. No, we're not going to be gentle with Joey. I'm not going to be gentle with Joey. He can be gentle with Joey. But anyway, I think it'll be fun, spirited conversation. Um, I can't wait to talk things, all things beer. What did I say in the newsletter? Beer, bikes, and banter. So I'm excited about that. All right, I'm going to switch back up. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, sometimes I wish I had um, music playing while I kind of start the, the live stream. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is um, something that happened to me yesterday. I want to say shout out and thank you so much to all the friends in my life, both here and afar, who um, held me down yesterday. Uh, I had, um, I want to be, one thing I would thought about a lot this morning um, as I was getting ready, I said, I don't want to come off. I don't want to strike chords of martyrdom, martyrdom or sanct like sanctimonious. I don't want to be, I don't want to come off overly sanctimonious or, or like a martyr um, in describing uh, an experience I had yesterday. Um, an experience that thank, I was grateful to be a part of on one level, but it kind of went in another direction and um, presented me with a number of lessons in terms of like how I choose to engage with white supremacist culture here in Charleston. Um, I learned a lesson in um, setting boundaries 
yesterday. Um, and also, y'all, I really want to make this abundantly clear. Um, and I can't speak for all people who organize or who call themselves activists or, you know, whatever you want to call yourself, right? If you're engaged in this this work, uh, if you're working to dismantle white supremacy, if you're working to interrogate power, um, folks are going to lean on you in a, in, a, in, a, in a specific way. They, they either are, like, confident in your abilities to draw attention to things or they're just going to lean on you, sometimes without thought, sometimes people call upon you um, thoughtfully and with care. Um, and um, so yesterday presented me with this this um, great lesson in learning how to define with folks, define, I guess, the, some terms of engagement. Um, and also some bi- the bigger picture is not so much about what, what I demand of other people who might um, either invite me into certain spaces. But the, the other lesson is, is more less about me and... and Less about them, right? I'm not. I'm not blaming any one person, uh, but it, it, it's a, a lesson in, you know, me me saying no, me me erecting boundaries, and me just really being very clear about certain things. Um, and so, basically, we're going to have a conversation about preservation. Um, we're going to revisit again. Caroline Grego was added again. She will be joining Mike up the live stream in January. We're working on it. She's an academic. Uh, she's an academic. She's a historian, so she's got to get them grades done before the Christmas break. So in January, Caroline Gregor will be on the live stream, and I'm going to use her most recent or the most recent thread that I um, really enjoyed. I'm going to use that to kind of segue into what transpired yesterday. So if you are, if you were, um, if you got the notification on Twitter this morning, you saw or it, notification in your inbox, you saw it says Dave Infante plus the ways of white folks. We're going to we're going to dig deep into that because um, yesterday was an emotionally um, uh, emotionally um, to say debilitating would literally be like accurate. It sounds over the top. It sounds over the top. But yesterday I just I had the I've never had a physical reaction to um, this quiet hostility. I've never had uh, this type of literally all I almost I thought I was going to pass out. Um, and so it's a, it's a conversation about preservation. It's a conversation about, um, a lot of things. And, um, I, I want to talk about that in the context of Charleston and, and what rooms are, are, are constructed and who's allowed in those rooms and who's invited to join those conversations. We're going to talk about it. We're going to, we're going to complicate, we're going to complicate your relationship perhaps a little bit. And uh, remember, uh, analysis, critique is not boycott. <laughs> analysis and critique is not, uh, you know, light them up on Twitter, light them up on IG. No, no, no. Analysis and critique um, is just that. And so I want us to lean in and be more constructive in how we engage some some of the uh, partners here in the low country when it talk when we talk about race, when we talk about historical preservation, when we talk about uh, social justice, when we when we talk about all these things, we I want to be more mindful. Um, and how we engage that conversation. Good morning, B Man. I want to say shout out, B Man. This live stream is unofficially brought to you by Queen Comb, <laughs> by B Man's honey. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to B Man. No, you, you a real one. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you for having. Um, thank you for um being raised right and saying good morning. <laughs> if you're watching on uh, on Twitch this morning, if you're joining me, welcome, welcome. Say good morning. Th- drop a thumbs up if you like to watch quietly, like my best friends do, and don't let me know they're lurking. Um, <laughs> good morning. How you doing? Hey, fam. All right. So let me just get to it. All right. Switch it up. <laughs> what up, D Bartlett? It's good to see you. Oh, <laughs> thanks for the love. All right, so again, 8.30. Y'all know how we do. 8.30, we're going to talk to Dave Infante. Y'all, there's a lot of news. What's up, Amethyst? Amethyst, look, look, look. I don't know how much um, bandwidth you got um, to, to listen, not to do anything, to listen. But um, you asked me a question yesterday, and the answer is going to be in this live stream. Just just white folk is just exhausting. Um, Charleston is exhausting. Charleston is so fucking exhausting mentally spiritually psychologically <laughs> emotionally supernaturally charleston is so is charleston is hell for a black person shout out what up um alvin look at alvin y'all hey um good morning good morning thank you for saying good morning philosophically <laughs> what up brandon what's up brandon what's up what's up all right so yeah dave infante gonna join us via zoom at 8 30 
Um, on, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to do that. So let me... Uh, so we got to do a really... I don't know how quick I can make this. I'm going to put myself on a buzzer beater. I'm going to peruse the news. Look, the, the, the one thing I tell y'all to, to please use your library card to gain access to as many issues, as, as many editions of the Post and Courier as possible. Please do that. But there's some reason... There's sometimes... There are a lot of instances instances especially recently so many instances where the digital um the digital website the digital uh version of the news is so important because they updated in real time right um so this is the post and courier you know when you log on to the website whatever uh these are the stories um they're talking about that remember that affordable housing um, project or proposal, thirty million dollar property uh, that the housing authority is trying to purchase. I believe no, 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 no. This is different. This is the Charleston County to designate thirty million dollars in property for affordable housing. We'll see where that's supposed to be. All right, um, we're not going to dig deep into that. We're going to touch lightly on um, a very important issue. But honestly, I don't have the bandwidth. I don't have the the range right now to discuss uh, the redistricting uh, news, but we're going to talk about this. South Carolina House adopts its own voting lines. Five incumbents face losing. Um, five incumbents face being tossed. Um, somebody dealing dope out of a taco truck. All right, down here. This is some big news. This is some big news right here. And I posted the state covered this. Uh, Joseph Bustos covered this story with the, uh, with the state newspaper. I shared that. I shared the PDF version uh, uh, on Twitter last night. So basically, a little dust up in the maze camp. We're going to get there. All right. Um, let me see. And then this one right here. Real quick, real quick, real quick. A South Carolina couple pleads guilty to storming the Capitol together on January 6th. I really do hope these keep coming. Because we know, uh, I, ain't, I don't know what's going on with Corey Allen. Is he still active? Is he still out there in the streets acting like he ain't got, he don't, you know, fear no man or nothing? Because uh, we know that he also, uh, he and Tyler, Tyler Bessinger and Corey Allen, um, both Proud Boys, both white nationalists, both um, subscribe to a neo-Confederate ideology. Um, you know, we know they were at the Capitol. They were getting bear sprayed. So they were somewhere close enough to get sprayed. Um, by, by Mace or whatever they they stole from cops. All right, all right. So this is a hand in hand couple, <laughs> a hand in hand couple who stormed the U.S. Capitol together on January 6th, even holding hands at the time, have pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor to misdemeanor charges in exchange for lighter punishment from a federal judge. Uh, so a 52 year old grown ass man and his 44 year old wife, um, uh, they pled guilty December 2nd, became the fourth. And fifth, South Carolina, there's got to be way more. The whole caravan met in Columbia. A whole caravan met in Columbia. And this is only the fourth and fifth. Maybe to be convicted. Maybe there's still charges. There's got to be way more charges. But this is the fourth and fifth conviction, according to Avery Wilkes here. This is Avery, right? Yeah. So I'm watching that story. I just want to know what accountability looks like. What's up? Who's this? Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth Ray Roberts. Who that? Hi, good morning. Good morning. Hey, Anna Marks. Good morning. So, yeah, we're going to watch that story. Um, we're going to see, like, real quick, let's, let's just read this a little bit. And Thomas Lavelli, yep. Thomas Lavelli wrote this piece real quick. Um, South Carolina Congresswoman Nancy Mace, chief of staff and campaign manager, resigns, right? So she's a young chief of staff. Was she, like, 32? 30, 32? So U.S. Rep um, Nancy Mace U.S. Rep. Uh, Nancy Mace's chief of staff and campaign manager has resigned after helping the Charleston Republican flip South Carolina's first congressional uh, districts uh, district back to GOP control. Uh, Mar Mara Mara, you know how I do whiskey neat. <laughs> um, Mara <laughs> uh, Melstrom resigned this week, according to Mace's office. Um, Don Hanlon. The deputy chief of staff and legislative director will take over as acting chief of staff. Uh, his transition becomes permanent January 1st. Scan down, scan, scroll down. Uh, this has been in the works for some time. That's bullshit. That's lip service. They spinning it. Let me get down to the uh, to some alleged, alleged, alleged. Let me see. Uh, yeah, here we go. So Thomas Novelli made sure to, to, to put this in the piece. So it says a Breitbart news article said the res resignation was amid Mace's Twitter feud with the other conservatives, including Georgia rep um, Marge. Um, but Hanlon, the Hanlon said that the headline was categorically false. All right. And so that's something interesting to watch. So Breitbart is saying like, yo, there was some fissures in the in the camp due to the back and forth with Marge. Right. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Whiskey knee. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you and D gonna help me phonetically. I just can't. I don't know what. I literally see it and say it the right way in my head. And then when it comes out, it's just a different pronunciation. I, I it's literally, it's literally a glitch. I can't control how I pronounce Mar Mara or Mara. Damn the Giants family. The Giants ownership family. Damn you, the Maras. The Maras, I don't even know how to say it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's something to watch. Let's hit. Let's go ahead and hit up. Um, let's circle back to redistricting. Um, the state newspaper. Oh, no. Oh, we got to get to this, too. State newspaper got to chill with the ads. Y'all are the worst. Um, I don't know who worse. Um, Post and Courier had an ad on there. Um, had an ad on, on set, like, sponsored content on their digital page. It was like a big busty woman. And then you go here, it's just like banner ad, banner ad, banner ad, right? So um, uh, Nikki Haley's trying to hold on to um, being relevant, hold on to remaining relevant into 2024. Um, and so she made a little appearance down south, down here in Charleston, right? So she was, um, former, it says former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley mentioned former um, uh, President Donald Trump just twice in her speech, a uh, move that suggests she may be trying to chart a path. She don't know what she's doing. Every bit of advice, people it just Trump is just such a wild card. No one knows how to kind of plot their course. So um, she was down here um, at the Citadel. I don't know if Alan's still watching. Alvin's still watching. Down here at, at the Citadel, right here. So it says attendees at the Citadel Republican Society annual Patriot Dinner, a well-known stop for politicians seeking higher office. Um, so that's where she was at. But let's go ahead and flip to some news. Let me see. Let's go to, let's go back to WCBD first, and then we'll take it back to Columbia with WLTX. All right. Let me see. Let's see what we got here. I think they covered it. Hopefully they did. If they not, if they didn't, we just, we'll just read the story. Da, 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 da. Oh, here it is. New tonight, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley honored for her leadership while making a rare public appearance. This is Lexi Moore was there joining <laughs> us in the studio. Lexi, Nikki Haley spoke tonight at the Citadel about the future of South Carolina and this country. Burning Carolyn, the former governor, spoke of her accomplishments both as governor and as U.S. ambassador to the United States. Yo, real talk, the, the Citadel's Republican um, society, whatever, they've always had influence since, well, since I've been back. In, in Charleston, so since 2014, 2015, especially like around that the time the Bannon, the Bannon appearance happened and we were all boycotting across across the street um, at the stadium, boycotting Bannon's appearance. Um, I've seen this Republican faction, this Republican group on this, on this campus really wield tremendous power and influence. So um, just have that in the back of your mind as well as you hear more and more stories. Caroline Parker, who ran against Carol Jackson, she made an appearance with them. I believe she partnered with um, the Citadel um, and, and met with that group. Uh, Nancy Mace has met with this group recently. Of course, she's an alum of the Citadel, so we get that, right? All right, let's watch. United Nations. She says she's proud to accept this award, hey, not Joy. because of what she's done, but because she's represented South Carolina along the way. I can say it's good to be back, and I have to say it's a great day in South Carolina. We're gonna give that. We're gonna give that dress. Um, Former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and South Carolina Governor Haley honored for her leadership in front of the Citadel Republican Society. Haley the says the Palmetto State paved the way in her career. You have to hold a it was the privilege of a lifetime to take my love for the state I was raised in and blessed to have served to the United Nations. Citadel leaders say Haley's worldwide leadership made her the obvious choice for this award. She brought uh, Boeing here and she was a steadfast champion for conservative values when she was governor, as, as well as when she was ambassador at the United Nations. She stood up against North Korea, China, the other communist countries, and of course Iran, <laughs> while she sat on the uh, United Nations Security Council. Local, state, and national leaders took to the podium to recognize Ambassador Haley's hard work as a national and state leader. You have taught me. She stood up to other communist countries. First of all, <laughs> come on with the bullshit. All right, China, China, China is China, right? China is trash on human rights. I'm about to get extra banned in China right now. 
China's extra extra whatever. But like let's let's read a book about communism, please. Let's let's read a book about socialism and shut the fuck up, please. Can we stop with this bullshit ass red scare bullshit? Like and to see younger people kind of still engaging in shit that we haven't learned from like read a fucking book. Stand up to communist countries. Okay. So much about leadership and so many other women. Incredible governor. Uh, during her time as governor of South Carolina. I'm a big fan of Nikki Haley, and this award I know means a lot to her. As a governor and ambassador for a nation, Haley says she's grateful for her roots, and that's what pushes her to make sure there are more good days on the way for South Carolina. Everything I am and everything I will ever be was shaped by the people of the Palmetto State. The Republican Society is the largest club on the Citadel's campus and has mm. awarded past national and state leaders such as President Trump <laughs> and Vice President Mike Honor. Pence. Reporting live in studio. Honor, what made you say that? <laughs> what made you say that, Honor? <laughs> Specifically. <laughs> right? Yeah. Susanna, what's up, Susanna? D. Bartlett, what's up if I didn't say good morning? What's up, Brianne? Yeah. Yeah, Zucker should have made a fucking appearance. Excuse my French. All right, so um, what time is it? Ooh, 821. Dave, Infant uh, Dave Infante. Dave Infante is coming, y'all, in eight minutes. Eight minutes. Eight minutes, Dougie Fresh, you're on, okay? All right, so let's keep it. Let's go to WLTX. Let's do the redistricting clip, and then we're just going to um, set the intention for uh, for Dave. Uh, okay? Yeah, we're just going it, to. It's really, um, Paul Bowers has tweeted about, um, Paul Bowers tweeted about the, he's been tweeting about redistricting forever, but his tweet basically, um, you know, this is how they maintain control. What, what you see in South Carolina, uh, this like unabashed, um, bold, <laughs> unashamed uh, effort to basically just draw maps to keep Republican power intact is just, is just wild to watch, right? So here, here's a, you know, today a little bit from it and we'll follow up with a more substantive live stream with more information all right a lawmakers What's passed up, the Bells? new district map inching closer to finishing the redistricting process as news 19's julia kaufman explains this is important for lawmakers to get the maps approved before the election filing deadline in march with the South Carolina House election right around the corner, lawmakers are hurrying along the redistricting process so voters know who may be running in their district next year. All in favor say aye. This is the map taken up by the South Carolina House of Representatives. Only minor tweaks were made before it was approved 96 to 14. While some lawmakers are unhappy with the outcome. We understand that the Republicans hold the majority. We understand that. Wendy. But we don't understand what is difficult, at least for me to get, is how we can stand and say this is fair. Hey, Michelle. Others say it's the best option given the state's population shifts. The map that we have and that we voted on and approved is probably under the circumstances the best that we could could do. Mm. According to the census, some areas in the Midlands lost population or didn't grow much. Representative Beth Bernstein explains the result. The population in Richland County did not increase like some other counties in Charleston or a in in York County. She that's that's she Democrat, right? Right? I've been around her a lot. She's always been. She Democrat, right? Yeah. Right. I hate when they talk to them and don't like put a Chiron up with like their yeah, Democrat right here. All right? Put it put a Chiron up. Like, let me go back. You hear what she said? I don't like that. Approved is probably under the circumstances the best that we could could do. According to the census, some areas in the Midlands lost population or didn't grow much. Representative Beth Burns explains the result. The population in Richland County did not increase like some other counties in Charleston or a in yeah in York County. and so really we had enough population for 10 house members it's exactly so Bells, you just dropped in the chat here on twitch you dropped in the chat like i saw crystal matthews say dems on the committee protected their seat they absolutely did right right right, right. they're lying about richland county like i saw that they're using their data they're being real cute with the data with the data findings thank you Susanna, for for confirming yeah, and then it was so so but this is this is my bigger bigger argument, right? 
you're a dem, maybe your district wasn't impacted, or maybe you were able to to, to sidestep uh, immediate harm, but you're a dem, and you need to, like, to me, the framing of issues, they are so woefully just uh, inept in this state, like, the framing of issues. If you skate it, that doesn't mean that that's good for... Uh, for the the rest of the other your other democratic peers throughout the state, and so the framing here is important, and it also shows me that um, yeah, there definitely was some probably some protecting of their own interests, of course, but this also tells me that um, you know uh, Democrats are not playing to win; they're playing to Democrats are just playing to um, be, I guess individually survive some hunting, some Hunger Game shit, right? It's just the poor framing of what this means for. And I'm, I get it that she probably was asked specific questions, but um, this should this should feel this should feel like an overwrought decision. This should feel like, hey, this was really difficult. Not, oh, this was the best we can do. Talk about the rigors of this process. Talk about what this means for the party, and maybe she'll do that in, on another interview at another juncture. But. Let's see. When right now we have 11 House members. The plan collapses districts in Orangeburg and Kershaw counties too. Be because this is huge. This is huge. This is this has huge implications. And so, you know, as the Democrats will whip us up, I'm going to just bounce out because I see the time as the Democrats are going to whip us up in November, or whip us up for all, like, oh, get out there and vote. And, you know, we really got to start like pushing back on them, like vote for what? What does this mean? And there better be outside of League of Women Voters, um, there better be programming committed to dispensing the information that discusses the outcomes of this redistricting. There better be some sort of, uh, hey, this is what you need to know about the new districts. There better be a concerted effort to dispense this information from state party leadership. There better be. Because this whole let's just get out there and vote shit is not, we, we over it. We over it. Like, we can't out-organize. You can't, we, we're over it. And so, um, you know, that's that. Um, it's uh, three minutes, three minutes. We got Dave Infante coming in three minutes. Wanted to just show you the front page of both newspapers, both the Post and Courier and uh, the state newspaper. And we're going to come back to some news after Dave's interview concludes. It's concluded. So here's Post and Courier today. Today's edition, Biden urges booster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This really important story about the, the light festival um, in, in Charleston. That's really important. Here at the bottom, below the festive post, the, below below the festive story, you have House OK's new voting lines with five set to lose their seats. Right here, you have the story to the to the far right. Uh, pun include pun intended. Um, here, uh, area couple who stormed U.S. Capitol pled guilty. So this is the fourth and fifth couple to be convicted. Please let there be more charge. A whole caravan. A whole caravan met in Columbia. It gotta be, it gotta be way more than, than than five convictions out of that. Even though I'm an abolitionist, you get what I'm saying. All right, plans to put um, affordable housing on thirty million dollars uh, Again, we'll talk about that more in, in depth. What y'all saying in the chat? All right, I agree. All right, I agree. K bells. All right, let's flip. Let's flip to the state newspaper because we got two minutes till Dave. Two minutes to Dave. All right. Let me take this big red out. Smacking like a crazy person. All right. Um, so here, front page of the state newspaper today, Columbia nurse indicted. This was crazy. The Columbia nurse indicted in fake vaccine cards. I don't know why people thought this was just like an easy crime. This is a whole federal crime. The whole FBI is involved. Like, it's just like those PPP loans. People really thought they was out here scamming the government. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know much about the story, but it sounds unfortunate. Here is the, the story we just touched on right here. You have Wendy Brawley. So South Carolina reps, Wendy Brawley, Dem Democrat from Richland, and Jermaine Johnson, Democrat from Rich Richland, um, on the South Carolina state. I guess their, their districts are the ones that are in at risk. So Richland County loses uh, SC House seat after voting maps pass. So, yeah, that, that sucks. That sucks. And when you talk about building power, now we saw this is, this is largely inevitable, but it still sucks nonetheless. Um, and I want to see what the Dems do on messaging with this, right? All right, okay. Columbia hospitals drop employee vaccine mandates. All right, just in time for Om Omicron. Cool. All right, so uh, let's get ready for uh, what's up? Uh, let me see. Brienne, you said something. Oh, Brandon, you said something. It says feels like oh, it's the best we could do is the official South Carolina Dem. That's it. That's it. Right? Absolutely. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, Brian, you co-signing. All right, so let's let me close this out right here. We're gonna come back. Um, again, we're gonna. Oh, it's eight thirty. Let's start. <laughs> let's start. Hold on, y'all. I'm gonna set this up. Oh. Recording in progress. No. Stop recording. Recording stopped. All right. So I am going to. Do, 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 do. Hold on, y'all. I'm just setting up uh, the Zoom. So everything's okie dokie. OBS, Streamlabs. Boom. I'm going to put it on speaker view. And we're going to. There he is. Cool, cool. So, what's up? Ooh. Yo. What's good? <laughs> what's up? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, cool. How are you, Dave? I'm I'm good. How are you doing? I'm great. Okay, I'm trying to get the the screen right for my uh for my viewers. I know you can't look at you coming complete. Y'all, y'all see this, y'all? <laughs> Sir, sir, this is a Wendy's. What is this Arby's propaganda? Let me stop. Hey, so, hey, um, welcome, Dave and Fonte. This is Mike Duck. Welcome, first time, first time caller <laughs> to the to first, the yeah, first time caller, long time listener. Uh, <laughs> I'll ask my question about the Jets' uh, offensive oh. line, and then I'll hang up and listen. Yeah, well, you're not gonna get none of that Jets bullshit here. Okay, this is a big blue podcast or live stream. Hey, so y'all, so Dave, you can't see my peeps, but I'm going to do my best to relay anything from the chat. And, um, I have a feeling this is going to be a fun little chit chat. So, um, we're going to dig in everybody, um, over here in the Twitch chat, please give me a thumbs up. If you can see and hear everything. Yeah. 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 I hear a lot of, hey okay. we got some Hey days. Welcome. Welcomes coming. Okay. All right. Y'all. So I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. I've been, I've been, you know, just, uh, going off your, your Twitter bio and whatnot, two times award winning, you know, that's not in your bio, but two times, uh, James Beard award winning journalist, but go ahead and introduce yourself to the people. My name is Dave Infante. I'm an independent journalist. I'm based here in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, I moved here from Brooklyn, New Ooh. York. Speaking oh. of speaking of the New York football giants, Ooh. I moved here from, uh, <laughs> from Brooklyn, uh, about three and a half years ago. So I'm relatively new to the area. Um, like, uh, Mika said, I cover the, uh, the food and drink space as a journalist. I've been doing that for about a decade. I specifically focus on beverage alcohol, which is what they call <laughs> booze, uh, in the industry, um, which is why you can see my Arby's, uh, special edition, limited edition vodka, uh, behind me. This is, what? uh, this is a real thing. This is a gimmick that Arby's, uh, put together earlier this year. Yeah. They did like French, French, French fry flavored vodka wow that's a tongue here. twister yes it is uh, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah so i cover i cover the booze industry as a journalist i worked uh, at the post and courier for about a year covering uh the drinks business in charleston but i uh i've been covering it um the industry nationally uh for you know like i said about a decade and i am a big fan of the show uh it's an honor to be oh. here i'm delighted to get into it um we're not I'm, I'm drinking coffee right now not alcohol there's no baileys in here or anything but uh but i'm looking forward to uh looking forward to to hanging yeah no i appreciate it i love your energy by the way that's what's up no um i think you know anna anna of course i've been a fan of of your work um i i think i you i got um you came on my radar when you were interviewed by paul bowers for the Brutal South podcast, and y'all were talking about that kooky intersection between White Claw, <laughs> rocking the tea. Let me give applause. Yes, <laughs> Brutal South. Uh, but now nah, y'all were spilling the tea or the beer or whatever or the White Claw on that kooky intersection between uh, the Boogaloo Boys and White Claw, and we can get into that. But that's where I encountered you. You know your style of journalism and whatnot, and then of course you interviewed me and I bombed it. But thank you for being gracious and saying I. Did. I don't think you bombed it. I, yeah, yeah. So I interviewed you for Welcome to Hell World, which is a, a terrific uh, newsletter um, that my colleague Luke O'Neill writes, and I, I was writing at that time about what I called the uh, 
uh, the the legislative pain and suffering <laughs> speed run that our uh, that our that our big special boys up in Columbia were doing. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, they they got a lot of what they wanted in that session. Yeah. Um, but I don't think you bombed that okay. at all. I thought you you spoke with moral clarity <laughs> and you were funny as you always were, as you always are. So I I think you're being too hard on yourself. I know I am. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but no, it, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, no, nah, it really means a lot. Seriously, I, I am not a journalist. I never, ever, ever claim that. I know that that, that is um, journalism is an institution, uh, is a craft, is a thing that that so many of y'all do really, really well. Um, so I appreciate you being very kind of um, you're really it was a really good experience. I guess that's what I wanted to say. It was a really solid experience. Um, and you could tell, uh, you know, your values came through as well. So um you talk, you talk about all things spirits and whatnot. Only one year with the Post and Courier, so that's a little blip on your on your resume. Um, but can you tell us more about this independent journalism? Like what what you what you're up to right now outside of a fry flavored vodka connoisseur <laughs> stuff? Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, for the last year and a half or so, I've been publishing a uh, independent newsletter called Fingers, like the things on your hand. <laughs> Um, which is uh, a, a newsletter about drinking culture, being online and beyond is kind of how I frame it. Um, I use the the platform Substack, which is really popular with a lot of uh, journalists and media types. Paul Bowers uses it for yes. Riddle South. Hannah Raskin, who was also at the newspaper who I worked with, <clears throat> I had the pleasure of working with for a year. Um, she's since left the Post and Courier yeah. to uh, launch her own publication called The Food Section. I know you've had her on here yeah. to talk about that fucked up. Oh, uh, that's where? That, yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Right. Right, cool. The more the better. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that That's... fucked up situation that was going down at the barrel out on James Island. She yeah. did a terrific report on that. Um, so I publish fingers on Substack. And, uh, you know, what I cover is really anything that, that interests me about the beverage alcohol industry. I don't review booze. I drink a lot of booze. <laughs> I drink a lot of beer and spirits and wine. I really enjoy it. I'm, I don't have a trained palate. I'm not reviewing, <laughs> you know, alcohol, you know, like, oh, this beer tastes a certain way. I really recommend it. That's not my game. My game is looking at um, sort of how power is consolidated and then manifests and is projected um, through the corporate structures of the alcohol industry, right? So booze is just like any other business. Mm. Um, and that's something that I think is really, really important to remember. And, and many of us, myself included from mm. time to time, forget because we like drinking, right? Like mm -hmm. it's drinking is tied to some of our favorite times and our favorite friends. We think of that as, as, as a, a uh, you know, a, a happy, it, it has a, a warm, you know, fond memory for their fond memories for us, right? Like these are times, these are social moments. These are moments with family, sharing a drink with an old friend, et cetera, et cetera. But the company, the companies that produce alcohol are by and large, no different from major comp major corporations that, pu that produce any other packaged good, right? So the difference between toothpaste <laughs> and Budweiser is negligible wow. when you when you zoom out, that's quite, know? that's and, quite the analysis. That's quite the, um, capitalist analysis. Like that was a really good. Yeah. It's yeah. all just, it's all just fucking widgets just <laughs> moving through the system, you know? And, and, uh, and, and thank you very much for your money. Um, yes. you know, so I think that doesn't make Budweiser or any other beer brand or any other liquor brand inherently evil. Um, right, but right. it, it should give you pause when you assign, um, uh, undue sort of good sentiment to those brands because you enjoy the product and because they have special sort of meaning for you, right? Like that they get a pass. In other words, these, these companies often get a pass, um, yeah. because people love the product, um, without really digging into sort of what the companies are up to. So, so can I ask you, so on one of, one of your award winning pieces was on just what you just mentioned, the, the, the kind of, um, the approach you take to, to engaging with, you know, beer or alcohol, uh, you wrote about the power, like how there are no black or diverse brewers, uh, in this, in this, you know, we see breweries pop up everywhere. Um, but yeah, talk about that disparity that you wrote about or what encouraged you or what, what led you to write about that disparity? In I, that would have been like 2015 or okay. so, I think is when that that story came out. So okay. that would that, you know about six years ago, and I was working at a publication called Thrillist uh, mm. at the time, and Thrillist is a 
publication that um i had worked at i was there for like seven and a half years oh, wow. uh, so the time i started as an unpaid editorial intern which unfortunately at that time was still pretty common in the industry since then the publishing business has made some strides towards paying their interns which is good mm. but anyway this would i started in 2010 and i was an unpaid intern and i just i you know worked my way up the ladder um to the point where i you know five six years later i was able to start publishing um features journalism and and that's really kind of what i what i like and what i gravitate to and um the the goal with features or at least my goal with features whatever i'm writing about is to um you know find questions that i like am curious about and then figure out if anyone else has really answered those questions and if they haven't um you know, you figure, well, gosh, if I'm wondering about this, then I bet other people are wondering about it. Maybe there's a story here, right? And so it's this very messy process where you're kind of like, you're reading, you're reading books, you're reading articles, you're picking up the newspaper, whatever. Um, you're trying to like sound out the size and shape of um, like the question that mm -hmm. you have in your head. Mm -hmm. And one of these questions that I had in my head, again, as someone who drinks a lot of beer and, and you know, doing the, the mid twenties white guy thing in New York, I was going to tap rooms. <laughs> I was, you know, going to bottle shops and, and buying, you know, cool beers. Um, I never got <laughs> super into that space, but like to some extent and, and what I, what I observed just anecdotally, you know, in end of one here, uh, was, there just were not many people of color in any of those spaces and especially not on the production side of mm. like you know, brewing the beer. Right. And so from there, that was kind of the germ of the, uh, the idea, you know, it was like, well, that's interesting. Like, am I just missing it? Like obviously data, you know, tells a different story than just my anecdotal experience. So let me go see if I can try to find some data. And then I couldn't find any data, which I thought was interesting. Very. So, you know, it kind of goes from there and then, you know, you start, uh, you you're like all right i think i have a story on my hands here i think this is worth actually reporting so we you know i put together uh, i reported that story for a couple months i guess uh and talked to a ton of different people throughout the industry um talked to a couple historians who had documented um you know different aspects of the macro brewing industry which is not the same as the craft brewing industry but can offer us some you know comps um you know, and and there's history of Detroit's brewing union, for example. Uh, Wait, they got a brewing union? Uh, well, they oh. did in the okay. in the you know fifties or oh. whatever. Um, okay. And there's history of uh, mm. that union boxing out black uh, oh, workers yeah. from being able to join because a lot of the the yeah. union leadership was racist, right? right they right. they didn't want to be in a union with black guys. Right. Like they, you know, this is a white union. We're German, and you know, we're German Americans. We're uh, uh, Polish Americans. We're not going to work alongside. Right. And and racial divisions have uh, uh, dogged the labor movement in this country since the labor movement existed in this country. So that is not a new story. Mm -hmm. But again, that follows the point that I was making earlier, which is like, beer is a business just like any other business. It is not exempt from the broader cultural, sociopolitical forces that, you know, shape the way things go in this country. And that's an instance where, yeah, of course. I mean, like the same way the coal miners didn't, you know, white coal miners didn't want to be uh, in the same union with black coal miners in West Virginia, white brewers didn't want to be in the same union with black brewers yeah. in Detroit, yeah. you know? So these things are happening both inside and outside the beer business. So you have some of that historical data, you have an absence of modern day data about the craft beer industry. You have a lot of anecdotal sort of, uh, you know, experiences, both of my own and then obviously of sources. Um, and, it, you know, it was just something that people weren't really talking about at that time. And it was really interesting to me. Um, and so I, I, we, we published the piece and it did, you know, it performed well, so to speak, like you're always kind of keeping an eye on traffic, uh, yeah. you know, in a publication like that, that's the big thing is like how many, kind you know, unique sessions. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, that's not necessarily the metric that I care about, but for my job, I kind of, at that time I kind of had to, yeah. and it performed well enough, um, on that regard. And then, yeah, sure. They, the, the publication submitted it to the James Beards. I actually didn't even, wow. uh, I didn't even know they did. Um, but then, yeah, we, we, we won the award and, uh, I love, wait, let me just pause you. Real quick. First of all, I'm picking up on the we language. 
Um, I thought it was false humility at one point, but I'm, I'm really digging it. Like you really like you just. Uh, <laughs> now nah, I'm joking. No, <laughs> no but no, nah, yeah, you know, it, it, I really. Um, that sounds just like so. It happened organically. You just wrote about something that you thought was important. That's something that that you were curious about, and it, it they submitted it, huh? Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> and the thing about the we language, it's funny. I believe me, I have no shortage of ego, so this is not false humility. <laughs> I'll, right. I'll annoy the shit out of you over the course of this conversation <laughs> with a bunch of arrogant statements, but. Uh, <laughs> um, no, the we thing is just like uh, the way the reason I think like that is because like, you know, you don't see how the sausage gets made from mm -hmm. the outside of the publication. You're a very astute media critic. I really appreciate your media criticism and you're really all over sort of uh -huh. the way South Carolina media is framing and, you know, uh, positioning uh, coverage. So you, you probably know this, but maybe people who are a little bit further removed from media and are a little bit more passive in the reception of media don't realize that like a story like the feature that I wrote is it, 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 like, to, you know, half dozen people are working on that. And so it's me yeah. and my byline is on it. But then it's at least one editor. In that wow. case, it was two. Wow. Um, there's a copy editor. There's uh, like a, a photojournalist or a photographer or an art director or sometimes all three. That's true. Um, so yeah. when I say we, it's because I'm just thinking of the people that I worked with on that story. Mm. It's not like... Yeah, so it's just kind of a bad retort. Or it's no, a, it's maybe a little bit. I, no, no, no. I, I no, I, I appreciated it. Some like I just because because no I, because I picked up on what you just what you were just referring to that it is a collect like a, a collaborative effort. Um, and of course, like you said, you got the byline, but um, I, I like the we language because people don't know. Sometimes even me, I might I might give the one journalist a little bit too much uh, ire. I guess if if maybe the editorial staff had a little bit more. I guess a hand in, in something the way something was crafted. So I, yeah, I no doubt. Yeah. Go ahead. No doubt. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a tough. It's it's really tough. And this is one of the. I mean, you know, there are many problems with sort of journalistic conventions, mm -hmm. and I think you're pretty. Uh, you have your finger on the pulse of what some of those are, certainly. But that's one that's a little bit more mechanical and still pretty problematic. Is that like, you know, when an article succeeds, the whole publication gets the win. Mm. Uh, when an article fails, <laughs> the journalist stands alone and takes all of the shit for it, right? right? And like, don't you know? Don't mistake this for me, you know, trying to excuse bad journalism. Certainly not. No, no. no. But there is a little bit of a power imbalance there because the journalist, by and large. Uh, you know, are, are not the most, I mean, almost never is the journalist the most powerful person in the information supply chain that has delivered that article to your, your smartphone or your magazine or whatever. Like there were people making decisions that had more clout and more ability to say no or to stop it or to gut check it in a way and be like, wait, what the fuck are we publishing? Mm -hmm. Like that didn't do it. So like there were failures up and down the line. Unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, to use the colloquialism, like mm -hmm. the journalist gets left holding the bag yeah. and uh, for better or worse, you know? Yeah, no, I appreciate that insight. Um, it's something that I had to gently remind myself of um, when I'm going hard on, on some of the, some of the people. Yeah, this is, this is Mika being like, all right, who gets the smoke? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm still going to give it. I'm going to give a fuck. So like, yeah, we ain't. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I'm, I, I'm, I, this, the next comment, just rep, this is just my viewpoint, not Dave, so I just want to get put it. But like, if you gonna write about Nancy Mason, that you gonna spend like five minutes on her romper, I'm a fucking flame you. I don't give a fuck who edited it. So I'm a, I'm gonna come at your goddamn neck. All right, you getting a cosign from the chat? Um, uh, my I call my my homegirl here whiskey neat in the uh, I guess in the beverage industry. She dropped a stat in the chat, Dave. She says that um about but one to two percent of U.S. breweries are black owned. Um, and we talked about that on the previous live stream. Um, uh, that disparity and, and uh, we we. Also, we visited the. Uh, I visited your piece that you did when BJ weighed in. I, I got I got some smoke for you. So like, because I'm an equal opportunity like smoke giver. But no, not not not, not, <laughs> not smoke. But like, um, yeah, the, the piece that you did uh, about brew it was with BJ and it was talking about the whole yep. Gullah Cream Ale. And I it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I was like, eh, I don't know about that. I and I guess I struggled with not just do I agree with it or not, and more so, um, you know, I think BJ being in this position where he can, and I love BJ. I think he's brilliant. Um, he might not appreciate how I go about uh, critiquing some of the things, um, not just him, but other black Gullah stakeholders how they move. But anyway, the the, the piece you wrote that kind of. That, that, that I reacted to was like uh, the piece uh, just about him being like almost like, hey, I'm going to deem this 
this uh, white owned brewery or beer maker, I'm going to say it's okay that they did this thing by using our culture, you know, because I, because I personally had a conversation and I was like, well, could there have been more included about, you know, like the one, one man can't determine what's, you know, socially sure. or culturally acceptable. I don't know. That that was just some of my pushback on that, but um, I thought it was, yeah. A, yeah. Well, go ahead. I think, you can I think, I think I, it's, it's a fair critique uh, noted. I think, <laughs> I remember most of the specifics of the piece, the, like the deal was that Revelry Brewing was uh, brewing this collaboration beer with BJ Dennis and it was using like Anson Mills, yeah. one of their like heritage rice strains. And Anson Mills does a lot of these really cool projects where they're, yeah. they're you know, trying to uh, bring back a lot of these old grains and BJ uh, developed a beer with, with the folks at Revelry about it. And so yeah, I covered that uh, beer launch. And like I said, I don't really do, product coverage generally the reason right. i covered that one is because there's an interesting angle there because mm. uh, a couple of years prior um revelry had come under some yeah. criticism for gola cream ale which really right. had no uh, initially at least had no ties to any like gola right. community and then they kind of retroactively had like <laughs> you know linked up with some gola organization to uh right. kind of put a yeah. charitable spin on it let's say um <laughs> so so i was reporting on that and like i was interested in like the tension or like okay cool so like the same brewery that just did something like this is now doing it again bj at the time was and maybe still although i think he maybe has like intentionally drawn back from the limelight a little bit but like at the time was i think held a a uh, pretty prominent yeah. position as like yeah. the the arbiter yes. of yes. gullah culture yes. to a broader and frankly, to a mostly white audience, right? right, um, right. And uh, for better or worse, it, because he was the person doing this collaboration, like I wanted to know no, that's real. why he would work with them. Yeah. And then I had also asked, um, you know, because as a journalist, you never, uh, you know, obviously the person who's doing the thing that you're covering is never going to say like, yeah, I feel bad about it. Like, right, 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 so then right, right. I, I wanted to, I talked to um, KJ Kearney. Yep, yep. Know, yeah. yeah. Kearney or Kearney? I yeah. say Kearney. I don't know if Kearney, it's, it's yeah. a jersey in me. I was gonna say that's a jersey. <laughs> that's a jersey thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh but you know, I talked to KJ about it because he was on record criticizing the goal of cream yeah. ale. KJ felt all right about it. And you yeah. can make the argument that, well, Dave, you should have run that one that one further down and, <laughs> and sort of drawn out the 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 complexity of like, yeah, like one guy doesn't get to give a pass here. Right. Um and I think that's true. Um, I, I, you know, that article probably could have included something along those lines. I will say, not to get myself fully off no, the hook ahead. here, but like, go ahead, go yeah. The shit, like, something that's mind blowing about the newspaper, and probably one of the reasons I'll never work in it. I mean, there are many reasons, but <laughs> I'll never work in a newspaper again. Is mm -hmm. uh, word count limitations are like really? Oh wow, they're I'm like you like have to just cut like you you write to the space that you have. Oh. Um, and it's really fucking weird because I've never done, I came up through digital media where like, I've never had to fit it into anything. You like run, you write the article, like when you feel like it's good and it's in the place that it needs to be, like you publish it. Right. Like, mm -hmm. um, whereas with, uh, with newspapers, like you're writing for column inches and you only have so many column inches. And if your article doesn't fit within those column inches, like, guess what? Like they're not making the paper bigger for you. So right, right, right. You know, like you better find some shit to cut. Nah, um, I got you. So I don't know. I don't know if that specifically, I, I forget if that specifically happened with that article, but I will say that there was always sort of like in the back of your mind, it's like, what is the most essential shit to get into this story? <laughs> and like, if it's not essential, like I'm probably not writing it in because uh, I'm worried about space. And as a result, a lot of things just get flattened, you know, as a, as it's kind of a, um, a byproduct of that. Now the best, the best newspaper journalists do that, like can do that dance and it's a work of art, right? Like Hannah is exceptional at yeah. it. Um, you know, anyone who's been working in the newspaper business for a long time, they're, yeah, they're clocking their word count, but they're also just exceptional at kind of like slotting information in and understanding how much needs to be really, you know, maybe that could have just been one sentence, right? But like it's it that is a that is a that's a craft to yeah. use your to use your uh, <laughs> your term from earlier. So yeah. yeah, noted. Uh it's a it's a fair critique and uh I, I won't I won't uh no I won't argue it. Yeah. But um <laughs> I do think that uh 
that was like uh, th- those like concerns are kind of like always lurking in the background with newspaper shit and it was it was hard to deal with <laughs> no that's why i want to i want to interview more and more journalists um uh either like traditional journalists i, I kind of honestly there's a new like it feels like a new genre a new breed a new niche i don't know especially with y'all a lot of y'all going independent or having these um um you know different types of relationships with like other outlets like maybe vine pair or something like that or thrillers yep. but um i want to talk to as many journalists as possible because a lot of what i do talk, discuss is em- is emotionally charged and i acknowledge that um because it just it, it And also, too, I know that there are times where I overcorrect, but I do that because I don't find as many voices like I want. I want more Mika's. I want more people, you know, interrogating, you know, yeah, these institutions like like it's lonely. What you do? Yes, it don't even start because I'll start crying. Is B man here? I'll start crying right now. But no, (laughs) it's like yesterday was a hurt piece. But no, but like, um, no, no, no. I I think that's I really appreciate your insight. And I didn't drag you that hard, but just like it's more so the culture around. Hey. Let not and it is not for you. It's not reserved. Ju- it's not reserved judgment for you. But like, there's this uh, culture of hey, let's just go to this messianic black figure, black male figure, and um, really doesn't. People tend not to mine for other perspectives, you know. And there there are tons of of black people, women, maybe you know, all kinds of people who work in food and bev that like could offer up some insight. But uh, again, that's not that's not all on you. Um, what I wanted to ask you though, so last night, so I, I kind of told the Twitch peeps uh, before I started that we had the email exchange. I sent you the links and y'all that all that, and you said you wanted to talk about two things that I was really excited to talk about. Uh, your views on biking and pedestrian like culture here in Charleston and also Joe Cunningham and breweries. So you tell me where you want to, where you want to go next. Let's go. Let's go to beer first. We're still on okay. beer. So okay. let's stick with beer. Okay. And then we'll, we'll, you know, <laughs> once every, once everyone's done with that, like I'll bore everyone to death with my uh, transit advocacy. <laughs> at the end. Yeah. No, we love it. We love it. We love it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, what I think I put out a tweet last night as I, you know, like, cause I'm stoked to be here and I, I wanted to make sure <laughs> that I, hopefully we can bring some folks in from my audience to, to join. And mm. I put out a tweet and I was saying like, one of the things we're going to talk about is uh, the limitations of, of Joe Cunningham's <laughs> craft beer politicking. Right. And I think like, I've thought about this a lot. Um, I, like I said earlier in this conversation, you know, I'm always writing about beer from like socio-political lens, uh, you know, thinking about power, thinking about how this, you know, product that we love and we, a lot of us drink, um, can be kind of leveraged and used, uh, symbolically and as a totem and whatever, um, for different, you know, political gain or, or economic gain or whatever. And I think Joe Cunningham's, uh, uh, you know, political career is a really good example of (laughs) both what it can do for you Mm. and then what, you know, what it really can. Right. Um, And so, you know, we all know and I think or certainly the audience on this on this show probably knows that Joe um, Cunningham, you know, he he wins uh, SE1 um, in twenty. God, what oh, year it was, was that? that? Two 18, years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. God, it feels like it uh-huh. feels like a decade ago. You sound ago. like me. I can't keep it straight. <laughs> uh-uh. uh, you know, he wins SC1 in, in 2018. This is the rise of, oh, like the, the you know, uh, Charleston is is going purple. Like there's a, a centrist can win here. Um, you know, he, I think in hindsight, you know, I think he won in a very, uh, uh, <laughs> on you know like uh, uh it was it fluky was a, it, it was fluky it was a fluke yeah that's the yeah. word i'm looking for i mean errington <laughs> was a unique wing nut you know like she she had those crazy eyes and she was talking about like uh, uh like you know all, shoot she had like the look you know <laughs> like she was um, she was like low-key like go ahead go 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 she, you know, and she wants to drill offshore which i mean you get even the even the staunch, you know, conservative uh, Mount Pleasant boomers, you know, don't want offshore drilling, right? right. And so, yeah, he siphons off just enough of those uh, of those moderates, of those of those of those uh, uh, mythical white moderates, you know. Yeah, they, um, do they exist? Do they? Yeah, there's like well, there's like five of them. I think I saw him at Butcher and Bee the other day. Um, <laughs> Wait, but, hold on, uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> 
they do they do a lunch yeah they, they have a luncheon you know absolutely no uh, i got you yeah, yeah but you know so and his big thing is you know joe cunningham is a good looking guy right he's he's a tall white guy full head of hair mm -hmm. um and he he really looks i mean you know people this is a joke and it's something that like we people make fun of him for but like he looks like a dude you would see in a fucking craft brewery right like, at a central he, casting yo like seriously. totally mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's like you <laughs> talk to me about some hops you know um and uh and you know i think like that worked for him in that moment and he, he made that a central part of his campaign because uh craft breweries in the low country are a very visible very like Again, beloved because people like beer, so people think of these businesses not really as businesses, but as part of the community. Um, they, you know, they're a sign of like, oh, look, like small business and innovation is like succeeding in the low country. This is like a a story of of uh, low country, you know, uh, small business owners and the community coming together. It's a really nice story for a politician to glom onto and joe did um and he you know he campaigned at the tap rooms and and would have the town halls and whatever mm -hmm. and i think that's nice you know I, i'm a little cynical to it certainly but like i don't think there's anything wrong with that it's necessarily just, it's just sticky it's a stick like it's I don't, a stick but yeah. it, I'll stipulate on that for sure. Okay. But what isn't a shtick? Okay. Right? You're like, right. <laughs> politics is shtick, I think like oh, and so yeah. and so we call out that one, but we have to call out all the, I mean, like That's Mace's true. whole thing is just, yeah. is just, you know, like MAGA camp, right? Like, <laughs> like, oh, her house got spray painted by Antifa. Like for sure, dude, yeah. um, you know, like, come on. Um, but, uh, but so it, shtick aside, right? right. Like I, th I, I'm not against shtick. The, you know, like right, that type right. of perf I'm not, I'm not against that type of performance because it draws people in and these things are, like you know tap rooms are physical spaces that are good for community engagement and you know whatever i think the problem that that our boy joe run into run has run into um is that there's no depth to yeah. simply being the craft beer politician right mm -hmm. like people don't care about craft beer when they're going bankrupt because their <laughs> insulin costs nine hundred dollars a drop or whatever mm -hmm. you know people don't care about craft beer when uh their company is illegally busting their union because we have the lowest labor density in the in the united states mm -hmm. you know like yeah. it, it, i don't give a shit about ipas if my i just got another flat tire because our roads are full of potholes because columbia has been diverting uh dot money mm. to projects you know that are uh, mm. uh pet projects of other you know state legislators or legislators yeah. yeah right like there are there are you know and when they're out of power, Democrats love to talk about fucking kitchen table issues, right? Like we, we can engage the grassroots because right. we have to just think about the economy. Right. And then, and then lo and behold, like they get into power, they don't do shit. They lose two years later. And then what do we write back to? No, no minimum wage. We can't raise the minimum wage. Maybe mm. I'd agree to 12. Uh, and this is Joe again. Mm. I won't agree to a $15 minimum wage, maybe 12, but I know too many low country, small business owners that, you know, $15 would drive them out of business. Well, then that's not a fucking business, no, Joe Cunningham. Not. Not. Then what you, what you're talking about is just a fucking pyramid scheme where the owners are exploiting their workers through artificially suppressed pressed wages like that you know a roofer who can't afford to pay someone more than you know whatever twelve dollars an hour like then that dude shouldn't be in fucking business i'm sorry but like that's the reality like and <laughs> so i i just you lose me with that shit yeah and you lose me with like this anodyne like you know like oh why can't we come together and have a beer well because the other side is trying to fucking kill us right Joe. right so, it, it, like we don't want to have a beer with them no <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I i mean i can't i can't like you are like speaking my fucking language right now i I really just want people to be just a tad skosh, like, uh, like just yeah, peel back a little bit and require him to have more depth. Um, and, and like the optics are wild to me. Like the optics are. Hold on, real quick in the chat, let me just read some. Some people yelling, uh, insulin for all." To your <laughs> to your point, um, someone says. Um, uh, day of that uh, what is it? Joe is the David Duchovny <laughs> he has David Duchovny vibes 
Um, straight out of Hallmark Christmas movie casting. Um, someone saying big facts. They want me to play my bars. Yeah, listen, my bar sound effects called, called motherfucking, motherfucking bars. Cue the funk master flex. Got it. Um, yeah, you are flame emoji, flame emoji, flame emoji. So thank you. Um, <laughs> so, but no, you're right. I think we should. I, I really love your like the for real. I love the passion in your voice, and um, and I know that you that that's in your work, and it's like a. You also sound like you're having fun, though, while you're doing this, day, which is really... I don't know if it's always joyous, I'm sure, but it seems like you bring you bring a level of your own personality to, to what you cover. Is that is that true? Is that accurate? I tried to. <laughs> I, I hope it comes through. I mean, I had a friend who once... Told, I, I think this is a famous quote. I've never been able to track down who it's by, or at least I forget. But the quote I always uh, come back to is... A friend told me a quote, hypocrisy is the spice of life. Mm. Um, and... <laughs> You know, I think you can take that quote a lot of ways, but the way I choose to take it is like the fun and the and the color and the curiosity and like the bullshit mm -hmm. um, of life that kind of makes it worth living or at least worth paying attention to is what happens between what people say and what people do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that kind of like delta between those two things. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where I try to do a lot of my journalism, right? Like that's, that shit's, that's what interests me. Yeah. And, and I think like, yeah, I do have fun with it because I, you know, I would like our politicians to be better than they are. I would like our, our, our media to be better than they are. Like I wrote that piece of it. Speaking of our girl, Nancy Mace, <laughs> I, I, uh, our, our sweet romper child. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I wrote that piece about for the city paper after, um, you know, I just filed a quick op-ed for for Sam Spence, who were, is the editor of the City Paper. Yeah. Because oh yeah, right after yeah. right after January sixth, there was a fucking deluge of both local and national coverage about how like Mace is the principled, uh, never Trump conservative standing against uh, what she sees as you know like the the runaway GOP, and <laughs> and it's like. It was bullshit then, and I wrote about it. And you know, she's a two-faced uh, opportunist, and we know that the yep. only thing she cares about is her, is her career. And she's she's demonstrated that at every step of the way. So like, we don't have to just take this hook, line, and sinker. But of course, a lot of uh, media does, um, and we're seeing it now with her little fucking feud against uh, Marjorie Taylor, Taylor Green. Green. I'm just trying to get my camera. For, I don't know if you, I don't know what you're looking at right now, but I'm just trying to focus. If you are distracted, but in the screen. Oh no, no, not at all. Okay. I can't. See you. Okay, okay, okay. I didn't know if you had like two yeah. screens up. Okay, go ahead. Keep no, talking. I was, I was trying to think of uh, the Marjorie Taylor Greene yeah. name because I try to keep her out of my head as much as possible. Please do. Um, but uh, but no, like it's like oh, Mace is like is having a, a fight with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Well, like, show me the votes. Show me how they're voting. Are they voting any different? If not, this is just a sideshow. Right. Mace is a fucking congresswoman. If she has a problem with how this party is going, guess what? She's got a lot of fucking power to do something about it. That's right. And the most fundamental power she has is to vote against it. But her votes have been consistent yep. with the party. Yeah. So, like, don't tell me she's some maverick. Don't tell me she's the new standard bearer of the post-Trump GOP. Like, show me the votes. And guess what? She doesn't have the record. And yet, like, we're supposed to, oh, she's a single mother. She's a single working mother. So what? <laughs> so a lot what? of single working mothers are fucking terrible people right. a lot of single working fathers are too Come on. like people are people are people like their circumstances don't dictate how they're gonna fucking approach like moral and eth ethical conundrums wow. like their fucking ideology does and so like it, it just it's really frustrating and i know you're frustrated by it and, like <laughs> you know, I'm not sure because people don't don't do what you do, which is like just be be naturally curious or be like just go like think critically about what's being dispensed. Like I, I get I get really frustrated by that more than anything. But yeah, yeah, you gotta try. You gotta try. I mean, now I'm not the best at it, right? Like I have my blind spots just like anyone else. But <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think like the limits of of craft beer politicking to bring it back around yeah. and you know to Joe and to Joe and uh, and Nancy. Um, when Cunningham is on his way out and Nancy Mace is on her way in, they had this like bizarre Twitter exchange. <laughs> and I wrote about it at the time, just briefly in fingers, but they were like, it was like some like hokey, like, well, I don't agree with her, but like, yeah. I'm happy that like, she's a stand up woman and I'll like have a beer with her. Yeah. And like, <sighs> like Joe, like, like left her a six pack or something. I forget what the deal was, but like, and and like Nancy was like, thanks, Joe. Like, you know, like I, you know, we don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, something along those lines. Mm. And it was just like, it was all just fucking theater. Yeah. And it's like, 
and, and then on top of that, there was just like a funny little detail that the beer that she chose to like post about was Palmetto Brewing, which is owned by an out of state company uh, <laughs> and, and is now owned by a private equity firm. So it's like, oh, wow. If yeah, if you were looking for like a local, you know, brewery that actually like represented people here in in the Low Country, like you wouldn't choose that one. But mm -hmm. I don't expect her to know about that because again, it's all just shtick. Yeah. Oh um, uh, yeah. Beer, beer girl meets world slash, slash beer girl meets switch. Say ill ill palmetto. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah no, nah, yeah, exactly, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they did that. Yeah. They did that little like uh, WWE type of whatever. Changing of the guard. Oh type my thing. god! Yeah. Seriously. Like, <laughs> if you ever needed a fucking example of how it's two parties or just one party, like you know, go to Joe Cunningham's Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> In South Carolina, especially, that like the distinctions are are few. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's the there's that joke of like every time the Democrats lose an election, they look themselves in the mirror, take a deep breath, and are like, "All right, we got to get a little more racist." Like <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! I never, uh, at some point, I think that's that. I think I love it. Let me ask. I'm gonna ask you this one question, then I want to get to to the the bike stuff that you yeah, want to talk. Yeah, hit me. But one more question. Like, so given how passionate you are and how like woke you are, I'm sure you are very expressive on fingers. Um, and, um, whatever, wherever you like have your own little thing going on, can you go back to like writing? Can you go back? You said you, you said you didn't want to go back to, I guess, newspapers, but can, after like expressing yourself the way you do, can you transition back to like more traditional outlets or is that a, is that not a problem? <laughs> you know, I don't really worry about that too okay. much. You're talking about the question of bias, right? Like, yeah. and this is this is the big, you know, capital mm. B bias word. Like, oh, like you yeah. need to be, as a journalist, like you objective. can't show your opinion yeah. at the new at the yeah, objective. You got to be an objective journalist. Mm. Um, at the newspaper, that was a big thing. I doubt I could get hired at a newspaper again. But the beauty of that is, I don't want to. Good. Um, <laughs> the magazine writing and and magazine style writing, uh, which is really more of what I do. There, it's a it's a different creature you bring more of yourself to the work right like you're you need to be to use the term arbiter from before like you're really arbiting more um you know what what gets written about how you frame things like you're allowed and to some extent encouraged um to insert yourself into the story mm -hmm. um i've never lost a job mm -hmm. uh at least not that i know of um from like you know expressing my political views mm -hmm. uh i guess it's possible that like i'm you know not getting hired for stuff because people like look at my twitter feed I, <laughs> I try not to worry about it too much i mean like my thing is like in you know you've probably heard again you you spend a lot of time thinking about media you've probably read critiques of the concept of objective journalism you know view from nowhere journalism um I tend to be sympathetic to those critiques. I don't think there's such a thing as objective journalism, right? I, I think that we are subjective creatures and we make subjective choices and journalists are not exempt from that human existence, right? So the thing that you hold up as objective is really just, it's a status quo aligned with what you're familiar with, right? And unfortunately what we're familiar with is uh, the framing that the owner class w wants and benefits by, right? Like we talk about the real estate section. I mean, someone was just critiquing the Post and Courier's real estate coverage uh, oh, yeah. the other day. We're gonna, we're gonna get to that. We're gonna get to that. Yeah, after you leave, we're gonna talk about. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I don't want to steal your thunder, but nah, the point yeah, is, ahead. like, <laughs> those are those are choices, right? Like, right. why do you need a real estate section? Well, because <laughs> there's a lot of money in real estate. Well. Mm -hmm. That's not an objective choice. That's a subjective choice to cover real estate instead of covering, I don't know, man, fucking bussing, you exactly. know, or uh, right. or like put put give me two reporters covering the fucking seawall. We're talking about billions of dollars here. Mm -hmm. And like I get a story every couple of weeks, you know, like so the point is like and I'm, that's not even a critique on the Post and Couriers specifically so much as it is like there are choices being made about how media coverage is assigned and yeah maybe the language doesn't read as biased or you know you can't tell what the individual journalist thinks as much but sometimes you can man and either way like the choices are being made to either write the stories or not and those are the biases that you should be more worried about mm. than me fucking saying mm. joe cunningham is a walking ipa right like i can still cover his policies he may not want to interview with me anymore and that's fine but like <laughs> his his record is, you know, out there and, you know, like, I think it's worth covering. Um, yeah. but no, I, I don't worry too much about, 
I don't worry too much about that because I just don't think it's valid. And I think it's, you know, frankly, like I do a lot of labor coverage and yeah. I think most la- you know, most publications because of the nature of, you know, uh, for-profit journalism, like are sympathetic to the owner class more than they are to the working class. And so, yeah, I mean, if, if I'm a, you know, do I have a bias towards workers at the expense of owners? Yes, I do. Yeah. And that my coverage is always going to assume that workers are being taken advantage of until proven otherwise. Yeah. Now, if you prove it otherwise, I would cover that and I have covered it, but like, yeah, just because the owners, you know, like this is the classic thing that we've been living through for the past nine months. Like, oh, we can't hire anyone. No one wants to work anymore. Well, how much are you fucking offering? Oh, you know, on. like how much, how much are you paying them? <laughs> right. Like, and, and, but again, that's subjective. That's not an objective coverage, right? Like that you've made the choice to take the owner's word for it, that no one wants to work anymore right. rather than asking the workers, Hey, why don't you want to work here? Right. Right. <laughs> right. I remember I, I, cause I engaged Hannah Raskin before she left. Like, what is it? Why weren't like food and bed people remember when they weren't running back to the bars and I'm yeah. like, what is it? Some people went off and freelanced could switch careers. Like was, but, but the point of the conversation that we had was it was a multitude of things. It's not just one thing. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're getting a lot of, uh, responses in the, in the chat, let me just relay some some stuff. Um, so uh, Joy said, "Dave is Dave's free flowing, filterless stream of consciousness is refreshing. Uh, most people tiptoe so much around Charleston. It is, you know, you're modeling um, behavior that I, I need to see more of from everybody, not just journalists. But uh, so shout out to you, uh, Dave. Some of the people just giving you a lot of cosigns. Um, they're acknowledging that you can do and say what you can. You can do and say what you do also because you enjoy white male privilege, which is, you know, that's just a thing. You know this, um, but yeah, it, it's important." It's important that, um, well, I, I appreciate you share, uh, being willing to come on this this platform because I think when you stand in solidarity, or I don't know if you view this as solidarity, but um, when, but, but when you when you do that, when there's that, when you come and, and you sit with with this live stream, uh, you're demonstrating, uh, I guess, a willingness to, to to lift up other voices. So please continue to leverage your white maleness. Is my is my is my plea <laughs> to like I do, I, yeah. I, 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 heard and understood and i do view it as solidarity oh, i mean i think i think it's important to i mean there's not um, much left politics in this in this region <laughs> nah, and it's important for us to come together and commune and interrogate one another's ideas with respect yes. and yes. you know check each other's blind spots but ultimately like yeah it's same team man i mean the left <laughs> has been fractured in this country for as long as there's been a left in this country and it's it's the fatal flaw of that wing of politics in this country and we have to overcome that if we're going to ever move forward Absolutely. and so yeah no i do view this as solidarity I view, like i view my work of covering worker movements uh honestly and you know not pandering to you know union infrastructure for example like i was just covering to give a quick example i mm-hmm. covered the strike in kentucky um heaven hill is Ooh. the biggest bourbon distillery in uh, in America and and by you know de facto then in the world um, and their workers were on strike for about six weeks uh, over healthcare premiums and non non traditional scheduling a lot of the same stuff that uh, Kellogg and John Deere and some of the other bigger strikes Nabisco um, mm-hmm. were were striking over as well um, and they ultimately landed a contract uh, I guess like late October early November. Um, and the union touted it as a win, um, but the wor- many of the workers actually weren't that happy with it. And when I dug in and reported on it, um, it turned out that the contract they accepted was basically the same as the one they were striking over from six weeks ago, and that 55% of the workers mm. uh, actually voted to stay on strike. Um, mm. But it's not a simple majority rule in that oh, union. Um, mm. You have to have two thirds uh, of the of the vote. Otherwise, union officials can make a decision based on like their you know w- what they see to be appropriate. And so the two thirds. This is effectively minority rule within mm. the union infrastructure. And so the Heaven Hill workers went back to work with a contract that a lot of them weren't happy with, um, and that m- the majority of them didn't vote for. And if you don't cover that, then, you know, that's a bad, that, that makes the union look bad, certainly. And I mm-hmm. think there's maybe a tendency to be like, no, unions are good. Like, we can't write negative shit about unions. <laughs> but if you don't cover that shit, then, like, 
workers aren't going to get mad and aren't going to get pissed off Absolutely. and aren't going to try to reform their unions, which, by the way, can happen. The United Auto Workers just voted yesterday in a landmark watershed vote. This is huge labor news and should be, therefore, huge news for the country, but you won't see it in the New York Times, mm. um, to uh, get rid of their, like, effectively their electoral college, their delegate, mm -hmm. you know, system, and do one member, one vote. So now they are a simple democracy oh. when they, they're just, everything's a referendum with the entire union whenever anything happens. And that, that union has been plagued by corruption. Uh, union officials have, you know, over the course of the 70s, 80s, 90s, have done tons of insider concessionary deals with the companies um, in order, you know, to receive kickbacks in order to, you know, do shittier deals for the rank and file <laughs> workers, right? But like, you can't do that if there are no fucking delegates to be corrupt, right? right. Then you're just one member, one vote. So the point is, when you when you approach this shit with clear eyes and you write about it like honestly and and you know warts and all mm -hmm. um you empower people with the information they need to make change right if if there if if labor coverage was just like oh the UAW's you know going great and everything's fine like workers are then the workers who are pissed are like man maybe i'm alone in this right mm -hmm. like maybe maybe yeah. maybe i like there is nothing to be pissed about right but like if you cover that shit honestly and like labor notes shout out to labor notes is okay. a, a, yep. a very important labor publication highly recommend anyone who's interested in labor issues labornotes.org um they've been around for decades um you know labor notes has really led the charge on this um you got to cover this shit honestly yep. and in the cold light of day and that's that's real solidarity like that's yeah. you know believing that people can make their own decisions if they're given the information that you know is accurate to their situation no i really appreciate you um <clears throat> you you spending time there and dedicating a lot of your energy to reporting on labor issues um i in the south especially i think that's something that's so desperately needed in terms of what gets coverage, what really takes up a lot of real estate in our publications or on our television news and whatnot. So I, I, I really think that's imp so, so on, um, we're not going to not ending it here, but like, so on fingers, do you do, is that where some of that more labor, labor, uh, leaning content, is that where that is housed typically or vine pair or, yeah. yeah, I publish. I publish really. So the yeah. So I'm a writer at large for Vine Pair, which okay. I contribute a few articles, okay. a few features like every month. Okay. And um, typically, I'll do like more like industry, like trend coverage, yeah. uh, than I will um, like labor coverage. Now, sometimes those two things overlap. Yeah. Earlier this year, um, their uh, craft beer had kind of its the industry had kind of its like long delayed. Um, me too movement so to speak mm -hmm. um and you know women and uh uh well let's say uh there's a ton of gender-based discrimination in the craft beer industry because again it is not exempt from mm -hmm. the broader cultural forces right. of this country right um and for years i think uh it's kind of gone on as something a lot of people know about it. i've certainly tried to report on it in the past it's been really tough to get sourced up on because a lot of people who are you know victims of this discrimination are very uh, mm -hmm. they don't want to come forward and right, I, and right, right, it's right. just a tough thing about reporting on this but anyway the the dam sort of broke uh earlier this year and um the you know, there was a huge outpouring of of women uh, and non-binary people telling stories about um, you know the discrimination they'd experienced, the harassment, the the just workplace um, okay. shit they'd had to deal with, mm -hmm. and the response, like, I, so I, I covered that for Vine Pair, and my angle on that was this is a workplace issue. The only people who are going to be able to solve it are the workers themselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an instance where like my labor coverage and my expertise around, you know, worker movements to the extent that I have expertise, but like I've covered it enough to understand it is like that really overlaps directly with, uh, what's going on in the beer business. So I wrote about that. Um, you know, this is like a classic, uh, neoliberal versus like <laughs> actual leftist debate, but like one way to solve this is more, more trainings and more, uh, <laughs> yeah. more fucking man yeah. management, you know, like reporting tactics and yeah. tools. And dude, they literally had a fucking yeah. app where you can, uh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah, right. Um, yeah. and okay. 
you're just fucking kind of twiddling the knobs here. Like right. it's the classic technocratic solution. Like let's means test our way out of this, means right? Means test exactly uh, yeah. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm. Um, and my argument is the opposite. Is like you can you can move shit around on the margins all you want. It's not going to make a difference because the problem here is power. Mm. Um, Ooh. and work workers don't have it and owners do. And so the only way that you are going to keep workers safe in the breweries, in the tap rooms, in the distributorships is if workers have the power to protect one another mm -hmm. from the bosses. Yeah. Um, because, and, and for sure, from the bad apples that are amongst the workforce, I'm not going to deny that there are shitty workers in unions. I mean, all you have to do is look at the police unions. I mean, I'm from that. Jersey, so yeah, I got yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Go ahead. There's li <laughs> unions are not by, you know, uh, unions are not a silver bullet, no. right? And that's, I will never make that argument. Right. All they are is an in, like is a a framework or an infrastructure for workers to project power, yeah. right? Like they are they're a vessel. Yeah. Without that vessel, what do you have? Nothing. You have a yeah. fucking app, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Nah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. like, my argument at that time was like, this is the moment where workers, craft beer, craft brewing workers, need to get organized. Yeah. They they have the momentum. Everyone's pissed off about the same thing. That makes it a hot shop. That's a that's a term in labor. Um, you know, people are, people are all mad about this. Um, if you want change, like, don't look to your bosses to do better. Like mm -hmm. they're, I'm not even saying bosses are by them. Like they're bad people across the board. That's not true. Like, right. I believe that many bosses act in good faith and want to make their, their breweries better places. Like I I'll stipulate on that. I also don't believe that at the end of the day, their incentives aren't aligned with right. the, the it, working class. Right. And so you can't expect them to take the change and prior, or, you know, make the changes and prioritize the, you know, the reforms that workers need on a timeline that workers need them. Yeah. And that's just the fucking basics, man. Like you don't, it's not a family, it's a job. And like, the more you hope that they're going to do right by you, the more you're going to get disappointed. Former union. Yeah. Nah, I appreciate that. Um, you're really striking a nerve with well, me at least for sure. I have a question here in the chat and I think this is a good segue into, um, the Charleston It's somewhat, it's going to sound a little janky, a little good. So segue into the whole bike and pedestrian part. But the question was, is, <laughs> um, the, uh, some, uh, joy is curious as to what are your thoughts on Charleston F and B. So just bringing it back to Charleston specific specifically um culture here um being that you uh you hail you you claim brooklyn so th there's a lot of differences in terms of beer culture all that other stuff but yeah what is the fnb scene how does it strike you here in charleston <laughs> so i covered it for a year i've lived here for three and a half okay. so I, I i consider myself fairly familiar with it right like mm -hmm. i I'm, I'm out and and uh I, like I said, I go drink, I eat just like anyone else here yeah. when I can afford it, you yeah. know, which, um, but, uh, man, in a, in a word, I would say it's limited. Um, Ooh. and okay. like, I think, I mean that more culturally than I do in terms of like flavors and, you know, ingredients and cuisine, although certainly that kind of flows from it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I moved here in 2018, I'd, I'd been coming as like a tourist for, I don't know, two or three years mm -hmm. um, prior to that. And I, I was familiar kind of with the King Street drag. Um, and I was like, man, they're like, you know, he's really amazing. They're like, five or six restaurants just like right in this little drag they're amazing like i bet the rest of the city just has like all these amazing uh -huh. restaurants right and uh and you know I, whatever we moved here because my wife got a job here and um so we get here and we're like we go to those like you know whatever handful of restaurants and they're great yeah um but you get outside of that and you're like man, there's like actually not that much depth to mm -hmm. this scene mm -hmm. unless you go out into North Charleston, unless you go out into deep West Ashley mm -hmm. and you can find some great restaurants that are kind of scattered further out. But it's a city that has some density here on the peninsula, but the um, mm. the depth of its F&B community or of its F&B sort of like um, – the the culture around it yeah. is very one dimensional in my opinion mm -hmm. um and you know like there's there's it's the cultural engine of this city mm -hmm. and that's a problem because <laughs> it's yeah. not it's not powerful enough to in my opinion 
the F and B community, the F and B. I don't want to call it the community. That's not really what I'm talking about. Really, I'm talking about like yeah. the owner class yeah, here. But yeah, yeah, not the not the actual people who power that. Yeah, yeah. the work. Yeah, yeah. I, I have no problem with the workers. Mm-hmm. Uh, the F and B scene here is has positioned itself because of the way that tourism is the only thing going on in Charleston, the only thing they give a shit about here. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, F and B is front and center on that because yeah, hotels are cool, but like right. no one gets fired up about hotels. People get fired up about food and drink. Right. right so right. they've become kind of like the, the celebrities around here uh, and they've made vast fortunes, right. Oh, on yeah. their, their little restaurant empires here. Um, some of which expand, you know, beyond uh, Charleston to Nashville and to Greenville and, and Atlanta and wherever Charlotte. Um, and it's just like I feel like it's kind of peaked a little bit. Do you like think? They, do you think that they're aware of it? Because I, I, I really feel like they don't know how. Like I'm sorry, no, no shade again. No, no, this is no shade to the shout out to my boy Josh, Ramon, like all the people. Harold's cabin holding me down the other night. Um, but do you think that like, people don't have that self awareness that y- y'all, y'all are not what y'all think y'all are? I think people think the culture is Brooklyn or what's going on maybe in Durham. But it's not like it's not that. Do you think they're aware? <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, I think some of them are certainly like some people are savvy enough to kind of understand that mm-hmm. like the salad days aren't going to last. But I mean, <laughs> right now, like a lot of them are printing money. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. And there's plenty of reasons to ignore yeah. sort of like some of the weaker signals like off on the horizon there when right in front of your face is everyone telling you're amazing. And, <laughs> you know, like your restaurant's packed and, and reservations are booked for the next three months. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that I don't think that they're too worried about it and maybe they don't need to be worried about right, it right like right. there's a difference between like like building a sustainable culture and building a sustainable business and Ooh. I I think that we have a sustainable F&B you know business, business co- yeah business for the t- for the time being yeah but the, that the timeline on that is a lot shorter than a culture that will last. Mm. Right. And I think that, you know, what happens when none of the, I mean, already basically no workers can live on the peninsula. What happens when, when truly no workers can live on the peninsula and can't even really afford most of North Charleston, right? Like where's the owner class then? Right. Right. Mm, I'm I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of uh, a lot of sympathetic articles about how there are no workers anymore, <laughs> and uh, that's why we need to uh, you know give tax money to them to fucking you know like uh, do abatements so they can afford to stay on King Street. Whatever. I'm sure they'll come up with some ridiculous way to funnel taxpayer dollars into their pockets, right? Um, but in reality, the reason for that is because the city is captured by developer interest it's captured by uh uh, hospitality interest and for decades it is uh rolled over Mm. to use a slightly crude term um to anyone with a fucking blueprint and you know like a promise of jobs (laughs) right um, yeah you don't know how much you're kind of setting me up for after your interview but yeah go ahead yep keep going keep yeah so it's weird that's not a but that's but that's not a culture right like Mm -hmm. they don't make culture they can build the buildings and they but it's not field of dreams like people won't come no like you know, like, what about that fucking hideous Charleston Tech oh Center out God. on Morrison Street? Like, it's fu- it looks fucking empty, dude. <laughs> like, there's what's going on there? I don't know. It's a fucking monstrosity. And I don't, you know, they were at one point, I don't know if this is still true, but I remember my friend M.K. Wildman yeah. used to write for the Post and Courier. She reported that uh, at least when the development project started, the city of Charleston was leasing that land to the developer for $1 a year yep. because he going to bring jobs, man. Well, where are the fucking jobs? And furthermore, like, who fucking cares? The thing's hideous. Like, we could be building affordable housing. We could be building neighborhoods, reinforcing those neighborhoods against, you know, uh, uh, floods yeah. and you know, whatever other effects of climate change. Instead, we got a huge parking garage that, frankly, like, if you're driving east on Romney, yeah. looks like a fucking storm brewing under the overpass. No, I don't know it if does. You've ever- no, it looks yeah. it looks crazy. It looks like that. It looks like a docked ship um, from some other vantage points. No um, doubt. Yeah, I, I actually was inside because, um, shout out to the homie um, DJ Moldy Brain, Jared, uh, my co-producer here, my executive producer. Jared actually works up there and it is nowhere near capacity, I'm sure. But it's just, it's really, it's eerie. It feels like um, a scene from like Resident Evil or some shit. I don't know. That's weird, but like... <laughs> no, I get you, it's, man. It's yeah. not, but it's not built for it's not built for residents, no. right? It's, 
the developer gets in, gets their money, uh, and gets out. Now we have, I mean, that has like a massive restaurant like space in the bottom floor of it, and it's completely empty. Mm. And what restaurant is going to take on that lease? Like, what? No one except for someone who runs some corny like restaurant group <laughs> from you know either here or somewhere else. And like, and it's like, is that is that good for the community? Mm. I don't know, man. I don't think so. Mm. I live in this community. I didn't want that. Like, I you know like. I would yeah. just like to have more like nice places to hang out with my neighbor. Right. <laughs> so, so, so no, you you're not lying. And like the, some folks, um, shout out to my girl Hillary who just dropped in the chat. Um, she says she's aging herself, but she remembers where all her friends in FNB live downtown. And as a person who went to high school here and, and some did my summer jobs in college here, like I remember that very vividly, extraordinarily vividly. Um, how many more people lived on the peninsula, black and food and bev workers? Like it's crazy how much that's changed over like sure. tw- over tw- I'm aging myself but um let me see what else is there people are just really co-signing what you're saying um com- they just adding commentary about charleston hold on let me see let me see let me see da, 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 da. They, somebody said insert charleston f- food and wine here when we were talking uh yeah so you you are dropping mad bombs i'm not i didn't i resist <laughs> i resisted the urge to drop some sound effects but while you were talking but you're talking about like okay so culture in charleston so now let's talk about like you you you, you used to live in brooklyn um, so I just, I spent some time in Brooklyn this summer and like people are biking, walking, they are moped and they are, they are on all kinds of, uh, of, of pedestrian or people powered, <laughs> uh, I guess transportation modes. But what, what is, what is your content? I'm sorry. I'm being real sloppy. What is, what is your commentary on like how, how unwalkable, how unbikeable the city is? I think it I think it's part and parcel with what we've been discussing this whole or what we've been discussing for the last like 10, 15 minutes or so. Right. Uh-huh. Like you, you take that Morrison development right up the road from that one. There's another one. And now I'm talking about the one that's yeah. like across from Edmonds Oast. Um, mm-hmm. and is like kind of in front of where the Bridgeview apartment. Uh, yeah. Where, where, they, where back that dumps there. out. Yeah. 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 Um, there's a massive building going up over there. Right. Yep. Um, and Charleston has no protected bike lanes uh except for this one little stretch of brigade and cypress street that runs east west across morrison um at that intersection so i'm talking about like you know right across from edmund's oast up by butcher and b where it is now and there's like a three block stretch of protect what they call protected bike lane um Mm -hmm. which has like little plastic bollards um to keep to keep car traffic away from the cyclists Mm -hmm. Um, so we're talking about maybe 500 yards of, uh, you know, protected bike lane on the entire peninsula, actually in the entire fucking city. It's the entire city. Cause I only see it there. Like, I'm like, where else is that? It's not on John's Island. Ugh, no, ugh, yeah. for sure not. And yeah. yet like we have, you know, every couple months we have someone dying on the Cosgrove yep. bridge because yep. there's no, there's literally nowhere to, whatever. We have this tiny little protected bike lane. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was on a jog the other day and, uh, I was coming up Morrison and there's, um, like a piece of construction equipment blocking the Morrison lane, which is not protected, but at least there's a lane there. So I have to veer out into traffic for that. Right. And that's, that's classic. You know, like they're not protecting the, you know, they're they're not keeping the bike lane clear. And I got to that intersection and I just like looked over and the developer or the construction company that the developer hired has put their barricades um, (laughs) into the bike lane. Mm. So so it makes it impassable for a bike. Right. So this doesn't matter to me because no one uses that fucking bike lane because it's useless. It's just a symbol. And you're like, oh, look, we got some protected bike lane. Well, it goes from nowhere to nowhere, so it's useless. But um, even though it's useless, they like can't even fucking maintain it no. because as soon as a developer wants to come in and mm-hmm. build something mm-hmm. they give away the fucking farm to That's them and it. they say sure take take our public space and put your barricades on it and thank you for bringing yep. you know jobs to our community right <laughs> yeah. like and th- you see this everywhere, everywhere in this town like dude like you're walking down the sidewalk boom sidewalk fucking ends why there's construction i don't know man <laughs> walk into the street i don't care and like, i really I, I, no seriously as someone who who grew up uh like i, I really 
I know Charleston's an old ass city and it's historic and they, they 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 claim they're trying to keep charm. Nah, it's just really weird planning. As the growth has come, there has been no foresight when it comes to hey, let's make this place walkable, right? Especially the peninsula, especially the peninsula. Yeah. And and like it's not even about foresight, right? Because right. like yeah, <laughs> I agree. Like the planning in this city is is really a problem and mm-hmm. and you know, unfortunately for the next whatever two decades until we all slip into the sea, like we're going to (laughs) be, we're going to be facing the consequences of that poor planning. But I'm talking about something really fucking basic, right? Like you're doing a $3 million development project. Let's take the one down on line street at St. Philip, right? They've been doing a ton of construction at that intersection. Okay. Yeah. And right now, like you just can't pass on the sidewalk because they've, the construction companies have put barricades basically out to the sidewalk. They've obstructed, public property right like mm-hmm. you're supposed to have a right of way as a pedestrian and you don't because they are building private property that doesn't sit well with me mm-hmm. there's a way to solve this problem that works for everybody but it would in- involve requiring the private contractor the private developer to pay money yep. to install a temporary uh barricaded sidewalk yep. into the road right. to protect pedestrians from uh, having to walk uh, like with cars it's mm. dangerous other cities do this it's not hard like <laughs> it's just a cost of doing business right but it would cut into the profit margins ever so slightly of the developers who want to get in and get out with their money and so of course this is politically indefensible for i mean even if there was a political will for it from our boy right. john tech like <laughs> i don't think that i don't mm. think it would go anywhere because there are for God forbid we upset the developers, right? Absolutely. And so, in, yeah. and so instead, we have Charleston residents who live here, who work here, who are trying to stay here, who are fucking like risking risking their lives. I'm not trying to be over dramatic. Like people get killed in the street because cars are dangerous. They kill people. Yep. Like they're risking their lives stepping out from the sidewalk to try to pass to get to work or wherever they're trying to go mm-hmm. because someone is trying to build a new fucking Airbnb. Like that <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't sit well with me. It's not right mm-hmm. and it's fixable, but it would take a political class that cares about its residents rather than development and tourism. Absolutely. And I don't see that here. Yeah, and 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 K uh, K Bell's in the chat is dropping some some interesting thoughts that I, that actually um I was going to mention K Bell she, she mentioned like the race component to this. Is. And, and growing up, like, so I'm from Jersey, but I, I finished three years of high school here in Charleston um, when my dad decided to fucking retire when I was in the 10th grade. Great job, dad. But like, um, but but when I was here, I, what I would notice is like a lot of black men, a lot of black people biking for work or to sustain themselves. And like, basically, as the city has grown and has opened it, like just busted wide open for the for the biggest dollar. Um it, it, it just shows you like how dangerous it's become. I know people who have been hit on their bikes. I've known, I, like you said, the stories of fatalities are numerous, but I've known people who survived some pretty treacherous shit. And, um, you know, folks in the chat are talking about, you know, biking on folly is like, you know, uh, whiskey neat. You're saying like, you, you don't even bike on folly anymore because you know, twice you almost got clipped or some shit like that. B man. I know you're an avid biker as well. Um, yeah, I think you're hitting a lot of things. Do you, do you use your, uh, do you use your platform to talk about this? Is this an interesting segue pun, pun intended yeah. <laughs> um, seg- I, uh, yeah, right. segue into this? I, uh, I used to write about transit stuff when I was in New York. I've talked about like writing something for the city paper. I mean, candidly, it's just tough because and I, I love the city paper. I'm not yeah. trying to take shots, but like they don't have much money and no. I like can't really afford to like work for the rate that they pay. Yeah. Um, you ain't alone. But but dude, it's like it, it really makes me mad. I'm I'm here on Upper King Street and like, yeah, I think there is a race component to it. And I think there's also a class component to it. Oh, and those yeah. things are quite often go hand in hand, especially where we live. Um, but I I look out my street, you know, my my window once or twice a week, I'm seeing uh elderly black men in mobility scooters, mm-hmm. you know, the little the, mm-hmm. the, the, the joystick thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're not even on the sidewalk nope. because the sidewalk's so shitty. Yep. They're in the fucking street. Yo, I I'm saw kidding. that. Yo, 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 Dave, I saw that when I worked the polls. This dude literally came to vote. Like a like drove this thing in the street. Like it just was really wild. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a couple of these older guys that are, are doing this. Mm. And I've I, I should go out and chase one of them. I'm afraid I'm gonna scare them. You <laughs> yeah, please don't chase I them. I want to chase one of them down and, and talk to him and be like, what's going on here? Like I, I want to interview them because like that to me is a fundamental failure of mm. like civic life. Yeah. You can't provide safe passage for your elderly to get 
to their you know they're going to the food line typically like yeah. they need groceries and they can't get there like yeah. you have failed at 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 mm-hmm. uh uh yeah creating a safe civic life like i see you know a, a lot of times like mid- middle-aged black guys like are riding against the traffic coming back up king street because they're coming out of the food line and it's too dangerous to cross to get into the northbound lane on a bike because mm. people whip on that road yep. and now you know if you're in a car and you don't have the perspective of riding bikes you're like oh why are they they're they're violating the rules like why are they riding on the sidewalk well <laughs> if you ride a bike you know like it's dangerous as shit so like yep. i don't fault them for riding on a sidewalk nope. i fault the city for not engineering a system that works for people who don't own vehicles mm-hmm. no no it's definitely just- thank you i really appreciate your passion on this because i think this is a, a, a given judging the chat alone this is something that resonates a lot with people. I know Charleston moves. Um, they're doing important work. I, I know I, I, I kind of, yeah, Charleston moves is great. I think they, they're trying to do some important things. Um, you know, not perfect, but, but I think it's important for organizations like Charleston moves to, to platform these issues. But you're the first person I've heard like, really kind of speak outside of transportation william <laughs> transportation william um shout out to transportation william yeah, I know yeah, yeah yeah outside of him um you know like most passionate voice on this and it's really resonating with a lot of folks on in the chat so um yeah well, because it's yeah. because it's everything right like yeah. it seems like a niche issue until you start thinking about it like transit is everything yeah. like if you can't if you, you know, and we talk about this in, in more dramatic sense, like think about the Rosemont community that gets cut mm-hmm. off by the interstate and is now facing, you know, potential uh, devastating flooding if they ever put the seawall in because they're <laughs> yep. not protected, right? Yep. Like yep. They, they, you know, like this is how it works in this country and we know that right. and we know how to fix it, but it, we're not fixing it here right. and it, we're not fixing it because it's not convenient and you know the the people in power don't really it doesn't bother them they're not the ones who are trying to bike over the cosgrove bridge after dark and are dodging suvs going 60 miles an hour right Mm -hmm. like they they don't care Mm -mm. and they they you know maybe they care five ten years down the road when there's no available labor to run their shitty business because uh because everyone has moved too far away because there's no good transit and there's no good housing and you know then oh shit like but of course like they they never face up to the reality that like if you don't address these issues now there are consequences for everyone leader yeah you're not getting you're not the one getting hit by a car now so congrats you're safe at home or you're safe in your car but you know there are going to be consequences from you a decade from now or from now when you know this city is failing yeah. uh economically and culturally becomes a hollowed out shell of itself right like there are this these things will happen you know mm-hmm. no 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 i think when you have uh two consecutive well you have consecutive uh ambitious developers as mayor in charleston i think this is what you get these are the outcomes they prioritize development interests um and try to tell us it's about financial solvency but it's, it's deeper than that um it's a lack of will I really appreciate this. Like, um, I needed, I needed, um, I, I described your, your, uh, this conversation earlier. I described it as intense and refreshing in a really, 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 really good way. I needed this, yo. So I'm really happy that you're speaking so, so boldly about these issues. Yeah. Wait, wait. I'm glad. I'm glad. I, I mean, I take a lot of my, I, I take cues from you. I mean, uh-huh. like I said, I'm, I'm only, I've only been here for three and a half years. I try to be cognizant of the fact that like, I don't know everything about this city and I'm sure I occasionally overstep and get under people's skin who be like, Ooh, who are you to talk about Charleston like that? I don't know, man. I live here. I pay taxes here. I got hit by a car here. Like I'm going to talk about this stuff, you know? (laughs) No, you, you, I think you and me, this is the one thing I think you and I, I guess I identify in you. Maybe I recognize in you is like, um, yeah, like this lane is uh, another fucking pun. This lane is wide open and like, I'm like, like, okay, there's, where are the leftist voices? Where are left-leaning voices? Where are people who are not afraid to curse? Where are people like, who, like this all, I, hey, look, I'm, a, I'm the daughter of two Southerners. I get it. I get all of that shit. Um, but like, I really, I'm really happy to hear there are other voices here trying to to just diversify the, the media landscape. So I appreciate it. And then um, I want to know more. I guess I'll have to listen to, fin- is it the Fingers podcast? Is it the blog? Tell us about Fingers. <laughs> yeah, you can find my stuff. Uh, yeah, you can find me at uh, fingers.substack.com is where the newsletter is. And, uh, you know, it's a mix of like paid stuff and then free stuff. And that stuff yeah. is mostly about the the beer industry yeah. and, and, you know, the alcohol industry generally. Okay. Um, I do occasionally like pop off. 
Man, there's, like, there's like a truck like backing into my house right now or something. I'm like, sorry. yo, where is he at? His garage? Or I, don't, I don't know, man. I don't, sorry about this. It's, sorry to all the listeners. Uh, it's okay. Uh, the um, <laughs> there, yeah. So you can find me at fingers.substack.com. I do. I put out a podcast that's usually just interviews with interesting people from around the beverage alcohol industry. Okay. Um, but I mean, you know, I do occasionally pop off with stuff like I wrote that story for me of her uh, city paper city about paper. Mace a while back. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll go, I'll, I'll uh, get around to writing something about the the transit issues here in Charleston. But yeah, find me at Fingers. Uh, you can find me on Twitter um, at Dinfante. Um, you know, I think Mika, you've retweeted me a couple times. Yep. So people can find me there. But uh, but yeah, that's you know that's what I'm up to. And then of course at Vine Pair. But again, like you know, I don't. I, I'm sure this audience likes to drink and likes uh, <laughs> likes likes a beer and whatever. But you know, if you if you're interested in in the how power works in the in the alcohol industry uh yeah follow my stuff yeah i had all these questions about beer cocktails on it it's like no i didn't no <laughs> no no no, no. We're... <laughs> well we can do that uh yeah we'll do that we'll do that like a happy hour session maybe we'll do uh Whatever. do a um a twitch stream for that we should do that actually I, I, um in, in all honesty i really do like i'm gonna get out this apartment and start you know omicron is, is playing is being a hater right now but like i'm getting out of this apartment and we will be doing like more like i want to team up with amethyst you like just do things yeah. in, in your natural habitat. <laughs> That'd be fun. Yeah, That'd yeah. Be fun. Now I'll plug all your stuff once you bounce. But I want to say thank you, man. I really appreciate you visiting the live stream. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> all right, take care, Dave. See you, everybody. <laughs> all right, cool, cool. All right, y'all. How y'all feeling? How y'all feeling? That was refreshing. Ooh. I needed that. I know that was longer than we typically go with an interview. Needed it. Needed it. Needed it. Let me give Dave his round of applause. I needed it, and I and I honestly, seriously, it, it's um you know he mentioned how lonely it, how lonesome it can feel, um you know speaking the way I speak or speaking to these issues that I think should be front and center, in a, in a place where they t tend to deprioritize people power, labor power, black power, uh, brown power, you know, like, and it, it is a lonesome feeling. So when someone is like just spitting fucking bars, uh, I love it. It just, it makes me feel like I'm home. Like, like seriously, um, growing up, it's not so much about a North South thing as it is growing up in a really, really robust media market really has, 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 re uh, refined my tastes. Like, there's just so much, there was so much available that was local, not, not just the national stuff. There was so much local content and varying opinions that I was exposed to growing up. And so I, my dream for Charleston is that you, that, that we have a robust media landscape here where I don't have to agree with your shit. I don't have to really fuck with your shit like that, but like do something different. Um, and, and not just like what, what, you know, what shit's news is doing. I guess I should give them a nickname What shit's news is doing. Um, not just that. But like, like, like something else, like it, it, just something different than just, oh, I'm a staunch, com you know, neo Confederate or I write for the post. Like, like, you know, what I mean, it's like there's no gradation. There's no variation. So I really I really appreciate it. It was. Yeah. So, yeah. B man. Thank I know you would appreciate that. The last portion about transportation and whatnot. Um that I'm glad y'all enjoyed it. And thank you, K Bells. Thank you so much. You know, newer, newer to the live stream this week. I really appreciate it. Like your contributions to the conversation. Um, conversations are really, really important. Thank you, Hillary, too. It's good to see you. Brianne, you still holding in, huh? Hanging on. Joni. Yep. Uh, Joni, and your comment. I didn't I didn't even catch your comment before he dipped. Um, that's one of the things you loved about living in Atlanta. Yeah, driving was optional. Same thing, like um when I lived in um I didn't just live in like Philly, Philly. I lived like in the suburbs toward the end. And like one thing about living in, in, in Philly in general, like if my car broke down, if my car needed service, I never worried. Like there's a train, there's a bus. And like I, I and going to New York, like I just rent a car sometimes because if I'm visiting New York or northern New Jersey, I I I rent a car so I can go down to Philly and see some family throughout the state. But like I don't need a car when I go up to anywhere, like anywhere up north. And it's almost it was a pain in the ass last time I rented a car. It's a pain in the ass because you got to find parking, and I just parked it there for like a week um, until it was time for me to go someplace else. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye, Hillary. Have a good weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was refreshing. Dave is like a breath of fresh air. So um, yeah, shout out to the homie. I really appreciate it. So cool. I'm glad y'all enjoyed that. 
Okay, this is actually a good place to like, like I said earlier, um, what I teased out on uh, on Twitter was like um, Dave Infante, and then I put like the ways of white folks <laughs> to kind of take a page, take a page from uh, Langston Hughes. Um, and I'm not referencing that text specifically, but um, let me transition to what I want to talk about. Let me see. So this is a good set. This is a good way to to transition into to it. So y'all know again, I'm a big fan of historian. Um, Caroline Grego, she's been tweeting the storm. Um, she's going to join the live stream when her schedule frees up in the new year. Um, and yet, uh, so, so the other day she was, um, well, there's one tweet that I want to highlight that's not on topic per se, but she tweeted it. Where is it at? It was a message to white women, to fellow white women. Uh, yeah, right here. So, yeah, I love this. I'm begging other white women do not not to use the latest Supreme Court decision as a way to draw parallels between themselves and enslaved people. Chill with that hands made stuff, too. Seriously. So that's that. But um, and shout out to uh, um, this is another dream dream uh, guest. I should reach out to Carolina and ask if she should make an intro. I got to get Ashley Lauren Sanders. She's out in Colorado right now, but she's actually was on Jeopardy. It was like a professor's. A professor's, um, she's from the low country, from what I understand. Um, let's, let's click on her bio real quick and then I'll come back. So, yeah, historian, assistant professor um, out there in Boulder, Colorado, writing about black history and black memory in the low country, low country born and raised, right? So, yeah, she was on, um, she's, she's gang gang with, with Caroline. I want to interview Ashley as well. So that's on the dream. I got to just get my shit together. Um, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me go back one more. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I got so she was on Jeopardy. So I want to. I think it hasn't aired yet. So it's like a professor, a professor's edition. So I want to get to his tweet right here. So it started off. I I saw Adam Dombey's tweet right here the other day. Right, hey New York Times, New York real estate, that carriage house. So there was another. There's a story in the New York Times this time, not Post and Courier, but a story in the New York Times. Right, and this is the this is the headline. Uh, they didn't want another project. Then they saw the Charleston house. And so Adam Dombey, shout out to Adam Dombey. We lost him to another area. He, he's moved on. He's moved on from the Post and Courier. All right. I'm Post and Courier from the College of Charleston. So it says, hey, New York Times, that carriage house, in quotes, that carriage, carriage house would be uh, more accurately called slave quarters. You don't keep carriages on the second floor. <laughs> right? <laughs> come on. Oh, uh, wow. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Like, I love these historians. It's like fucking like I never thought that growing up and learning history from all these types of like crusty old teachers in, in school. Never thought historians could be this fucking like opinionated and forceful in articulating their thoughts. Right. All right. 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 So, yeah. While it's just so he went on to say uh, while they may think the history of the house might be so amazing that history is being whitewashed. Right. So that's Adam Dombey's tweet. And it got retweeted by Caroline. Right. And, and again, she, she references Ashley here who helped her with that, uh, that piece for the Washington Post. And then like, if you watch, if you read the thread, um, Caroline breaks down like that, that property that the New York times is, is hailing as this beautiful place in Charleston. She breaks down the history. She goes in y'all. And I don't have time to go in on it right now, but she talks about the history of the house, the white owners and it's, it's connection to slavery. Right. Um, it says, uh, it talks about this began with Dr. Was it Poyas? Or who had built the house likely by the house was built likely by enslaved carpenters in 1788. Right. And she just find, like, she just gets the receipts. She went on ancestry.com. Right. And found all this in 1820. He enslaved 80 people. So yeah, that, that quaint history, they all love buying. Right. So um, I, why am I bringing this up? Um, I'm bringing this up because, um, this conversation up this, this, this Twitter thread up because of my experience yesterday. So I'm gonna switch camera. I'm gonna switch to the camera only. Because I want to be very gentle and want to be very responsible. Like I said, I want to sidestep and ignore or, or sidestep um, an urge to either come off as a martyr or sanctimonious. I just want to kind of like maybe just appeal to y'all. Um, and I think that's the one thing I love about Twitch is that um, not just that y'all support me, but that uh, it's cathartic. It's, it's cathartic in a lot of ways to discuss uh 
you know, some a lot of a lot of things that I went through in Charleston as an organizer on the ground, I never had a place to put it outside of a couple of Facebook comments, uh, maybe sometimes on Twitter. And then I came up with the, the, the podcast and, and then some thoughts were there. But this Twitch dynamic actually is just a little bit better because I get immediate response. So um, I was invited to and I don't I don't think I don't think he minds me saying his name. Um, I was invited to attend an event. Okay, um, you know what? Let me pull up the pictures and make sure they don't have no incriminating. I'm sure I cropped out anything incriminating. <laughs> um, I don't think it's a problem. Let me see. Yeah, no, it's not a problem. All right, cool, cool, cool. I'm going to switch it back up in a second. So I was invited to attend. Uh, I was invited to attend uh, a, 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 an event. And I have the program right here, y'all. Um, the event was uh, was uh, titled "The Past, Present, and Future of Historic Preservation," a panel discussion, and it was a panel discussion hosted by uh, the Urban Electric Company. You know, those that's the place with the really cool lights, um, based here in Charleston. Um, as a former blogger with uh, home improvement and DIY, um, Urban Electric uh, was definitely a, a local local company that I really dug. I dig their aesthetic. They make they make beautiful products. I don't know how they perform. I haven't purchased any, but maybe some of y'all have. Um, but Urban Electric is, is local and whatnot. So, but I was invited um, to join to 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 sit in on this. And so the person shared, first the person shared to me, shared with me the invite, the um, electronic invite. So let me switch it up. It's my friend. How you doing? If you're watching friend, Uh, my friend Fletcher. (laughs) I'm like, why am I putting, I'm saying this person, that person. So, so they they shared, uh, Fletcher shared this invite with me. And it says a lively conversation, a lively, a lively conversation on fresh approaches to historic preservation, design driven development and community building and how looking at the intentions of the past can help connect the vibrant future while maintaining the spirit of place for the next generation. I'm going to tell you this right now. This event did none of that. This event addressed none of that. Right. Okay. cool, cool, cool. So look, 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 don't. Yeah. Cool. um, Honor. Um, don't take none of this shit personally. <laughs> and maybe they heard about me yesterday. I don't know. Um, so let's look at the other photo from the event. So none of that happened. <laughs> and to me, um, look, when I say I'm having a book club, it's a book club. And I try to be as detailed as possible as what you can expect. So you can manage your expectations with anything I create, whether it's a program, right? But none of this happened. There was no lively conversation on fresh approaches Right. There was there was definitely things about the intention. And exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. OK, yeah, I got you. I, I, OK, honor. I got you. I got you. Um, But th- th- this was very ambitious. That was my gentle word for saying um, ambitious. Right. So so this is the e invite. I didn't get the invite. Fletcher got the invite. Right. So Fletcher, what, what, I think what, what a lot of white folks don't get in Charleston still black people, black people, no matter how different we may look, no matter how different we may use our platforms, no matter, no matter how different our skill sets may be, we talk. And even people we don't really love, 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 love. We talk. Right. Um, and so, you know, it, this is not the only thing Fletcher shared with me because he's, he's, he has, he has gained entree into tons of circles, circles in Charleston. And I don't think that, I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think that's by virtue of the beautiful work he creates and people want to know, you know, want to know this guy and he's super talented. Um, so I was invited and I, I, I asked, I paused and I said, Fletcher, what you want me to, cause he sends me, he sends me the, the invite. I'm like, Fletcher, what do you, what do you want me to do with this? Right. <laughs> I see you cables. I said, Fletcher, what you want me to do with this? He was like, I want you to come. I was like, all right, cool. And I honestly thought it was just going to be like pretty much straight, like straight forward, whatever. So I take a look at the second photo and I'm, I'm immediately like, Oh, Oh, right. Oh, so let me see. So let me read the title again. The past present and future of historic preservation. Let me read that other part. A lively conversation on fresh approaches to historic preservation, design driven development and community building. 
Look at look at look at the look at the yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Joy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so not just white, right? Not just white. You got Winslow Hasty here and, and and many people have different opinions on Mr. Hasty. But the well, the fact that you need to that what you need to know about Mr. Winslow Hasty is that he's a, his family owns the plantation. Like you're an heir, you're an heir to the planta- to a plantation, Magnolia to be specific, right? To be specific, right? So Will, Will, Winslow Hasty is the president and CEO of Historic Charleston Foundation. So you already you already got the right uh, a nonprofit organization that champions historic authentic- authenticity. Please stop playing in my goddamn face, Winslow. Anyway, literally benefiting from slavery still. Um, family still owns plantations. You are the hate president and CEO of that plantation. Uh, well, of Historic Charleston's foundation. Dave Dawson is the president and CEO of Urban Electric. Lost a lot of respect for him yesterday. Lost a lot of respect. Um, and then this is going to be weird. Michael Phillips, right? So y'all Google Jamestown. Because if you don't know, you need to know. Um, huge, interna- huge international developer. But I mean, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna surprise y'all right now. Um, this is the one positive thing I'm gonna say about this event. Michael got balls. Michael, Michael ain't from no podunk. He ain't got, he ain't got no podunk in him. Um, if you were an international developer, you better have a thick fucking skin, and you better be, you better embrace challenges head on, and. Um, I'm just going to leave it there because we'll get back to w- what, what I'm talking about specifically. Michael Phillips right there, he had balls. Uh, he had you know, ovaries, bre- whatever you want to use. Like, he had, you know, he, he, had it, he had it all, right? He, 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 he actually approached me after. Winslow, of course, of course, you don't have to pay attention to the black woman um, who had a comment or question. Dave, uh, I'm sure I left him slack-jawed um, to a degree. Um, uh, yeah. So I'm at this event, y'all, and again, it's about history. So, so to me, historic preservation—that term—is already politicized. It's already it's already a thing. Um, it's already loaded language, right? Right. Um, but when you have a pan, if you if you're presenting this as a panel about historic preservation in the Low Country, in North Charleston, on the Navy Yard, how about you not center a, a plantation heir? one white guy CEO and an international developer. If we really want to talk about preservation and if you want to give the, just, just give the slightest appearance that you actually give a fuck about, I don't know, um, other interests, other points of view. Um, uh, you know, if you want to talk, like you're talking about development in North Charleston, the Navy yard, right. You're talking about like, you know, backdrop is Chikora. The back, the backdrop is like the making the backdrop is, is like all these other blackity black things going on around the Navy, and the Navy yard itself. And we're talking about, you know, environmental racism that was visited upon a community, right, right, right across the street, uh, or right near down down the street um, with the incinerator. You're talking about a lot of issues. I mean, you have a lot of issues. You're sitting in a place that's loaded, politically loaded, and you want to center, um, you want to center a plantation owner and an international developer. Now, I get it that this, they sent this out. They say it's historic preservation. So, but I do get that it's hosted by urban, but, but they should have made it very clear that this is about urban's design. They should have made it very clear this is about Urban's uh, design decisions with their, you know, developing the Navy Yard. That's what they should have said. Hey, um, Urban Electric is de- is building out more more projects, or the Urban Urban Electric is is doing more with the with this real estate on the Navy Yard. Here, who here are the voices we enlisted to help us make our decisions? That's what you should have should have created. You shouldn't have sent a paperless post out to hundreds, if not thousands, of people, and 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 framed this as a historical preservation conversation it was propagandistic it was um it was disin- it was um excuse me it was it was misleading um and it's bullshit and so they go on and on about you know they go on and on about the 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 the, the navy yard and how much potential and they talk about uh pre- preservation and how and this is so this is the funny part winslow hasty had the gall to ridicule developers who come in without imagination dude you literally like the self-awareness that this dude don't have is crazy as a damn plantation heir like 
you have the gall to come at developers who are not in, like this is Charleston, sweetie. So, sir, sir, like like sir, this is Charleston. That's all you. That's all you 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 interact with are whack, ima- you know, imaginationless developers. But anyway, um, so the the panel anyway. So the panel they talk about all these. Oh, we've done this. They play a video in the beginning. No black people in the video. The black the video was all about the urban and and how they d- decided to build out and they use words like community and what community building and there was no black people. I don't even think there were any brown people in the video they played. Um, uh, what you say, K Bells? Where's the black woman? I, I'm. I, I, c- hello. Or, or, or K Bells, at least like where are the black people who actually put a fucking employee there that's black? Put, put a resident there. Like, t- do, do something, at least give lip service. Tr- show me, right? So let me switch the camera up because this is, this is it. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm not going to spend too much energy on here because I, I, so, so yesterday I sit through that and I, I endure that, that thing. And um, just to paint the picture of the room, the room is, I, I'm going to have to say this white girls in Charleston. Y'all got to get different. Like y'all got to start shopping at different places. Y'all gonna have to start thrifting. Y'all gonna have to start like something because y'all all look the same. Like the room was a wash in just white girls in flowy floral dresses with the same suede booties on. Um, predominantly blonde. <laughs> um, I was the only black woman. Fletcher was the only black man. We were the only black people in the room that had, I would say easy, if, if not a hundred, I'm horrible with like guest, guesstimations, whatever, but it was, it was a, it was a filled room. Um, and so they, they do this panel is framed as historic preservation. And they asked for a question. Somebody asked an innocuous question about architecture and then no one it's like cricket. It's like any more questions. And I, and, and so I'm sitting at, I'm seated at the table with Julie Hussey and Fletcher and also, I have a friend. Um, <laughs> damn, I have a friend, um, Cyrus Buffin from FOGC in the room too, who I didn't know was going to be there, right? And um, and so they asked, quite, they opened it up to the floor, and no one asked a question. No one asked a question, and I'm like, please don't be, please let somebody ask like a substantive question. It don't have to be race related, but like ask a substantive question. Show me that you give a fuck about just j- more than just like pretty spaces to either work out of or or visit, right? Tell me, like, tell me somebody like has a. I know this is a friendly crowd, and the paperless post went out to a friendly audience that's going to be less critical, but just somebody have a question. Somebody, Bueller, Bueller. Bueller, like somebody have a question, nobody. So of course I do what I don't like, which is I ask the que- the hard question. I raise my hand and um, I ask. I said, "Hey, um, was any thought given to?" Um, I, this is just like a, su- a summary of what I said. Is, was there any thought given to? Uh, a different kind of composition of the panel. Like, was there any thought given into enlisting the voices of perhaps other, um, other members of the community who are passionate about historic preservation? I said something like, um, you know, and, and I did, I did call, I did call out Winslow Hasty. I was like, instead of having um, representatives from the antebellum industrial complex, you know, was there any thought given to uh, honoring voices that are not white and cisgendered and male? Right. I, I asked that question. And it landed very flat in the room. So just imagine being the only black woman in the room, a black woman of a certain size. I look great, though. Hair and makeup look great. Um, But just imagine being the only black woman in this room. And the indifference. The blood curdling indifference to my question. Just imagine silence and then imagine two struggle questions that I can't even remember what they said because it was real like empty speak. I think Michael Phillips, the guy from Jamestown, he tried, but just, 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 I want you like, like y'all and I'm not even being dramatic when I say this last part. Right. And I know you're giving me credit, Brianne, but, but it actually was the most, one of the most painful experiences. I'm in this room. I say this thing It's Charleston. This is not a new concept or question. And the indifference, the indifference, it, it, it pierced me in a way. And I'm like, oh, I don't have any support in this room. Now, outside of, of, of Fletcher, 
uh, Julie and Cyrus, I have no support in this room. I feel that so much so that I have, I never experienced this y'all. I never experienced a physical pain. I thought I was going to pass out after I asked my question, something, I guess I was having a panic attack. I think that's what my friend said. I was probably like, it was a pain, like in my diaphragm area. And it felt like, it felt like somebody was poking me or punching me in my, like in my chest. And I, I struggled to steal myself preparing for maybe potential blowback or a tough question and a tough, tough retort, whatever. And nothing. It was worse than that. It was nothing. Uh, Michael did make Michael Phillips did make his way over to me and say, thank you for challenging me. So I give him, I give him credit for that. Cause he was the only one, the CEO, Dave Dawson, he, he was mortified. Winslow hasty, you know, he, he, he doesn't have to pay attention to a black woman who says something different. Right. Um, it's different from what the, the what they express, but but I guess what I what I what I wanted to talk about here on Twitch um, is that um, and Flesh and I talked afterwards. We talked at length. Um, y'all don't let don't let a black woman be alone like that in real time. Don't don't in real time have her back. Even if you just stand up and put a hand on her on her back on her shoulder and say I, I'm I'm right there with you, don't let the black person always have to don't let the black woman always have to occupy that role of disruptor. You know, um, it, people ask me why are you so hard on REI and DI? Um, why why do you come so hard at white women? Because of what I experienced in that room. And while I, I love my friend Julie Hussey, I think her heart is in the right place. You could, she could have stood up and um, put her hand on my shoulder or just put her hand on my shoulder. Or I expected people who I know, who know my work, to, to do something in real time. And so why I call this the ways of white folks this morning is because this is how I know you, this is how y'all do. If I was in this room, this is how y'all do. Y'all would have been very comfortable with this white-led conversation about preservation and you would have been very comfortable with the plantation owner and an international developer leading a conversation, and you wouldn't have said shit. Had I not said anything, no one would have broached that topic. You wouldn't have said shit. And I'm, I'm making an, an appeal to white people who know me personally, who know me, know my work, who have either invested in my work in some way, shape, or form, who share my content. Y'all got to do the fuck better, because what I went through... What I went through had me in tears. The indifference. The, oh, you said a thing. I didn't like it. I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to ignore it. You said this thing publicly, and I'm going to, you know, no shame. The, the organizer of the event probably didn't feel any shame. But why did I leave with profound shame? Why did I leave feeling burdened? Why did I leave feeling like a janitor? Like I did the, the dirty work that no one else will do. Because y'all sit in these rooms and you want to be proximate to power and you need the next contract. You need the next, you need to, you need to be in the next room. And, and, and I'm going to tell you right now, this watching me do this shit, watching me get hot and then not doing shit in real time when shit pop off, shit getting real corny. Right? I'm not your mercenary. I'm not a hired hand. I ain't no fucking social justice maid. So that's this whole, oh, uh, I watch Mika. And then in real time, all you had to say is here, here. All you had to say is that's right, Mika. That's all you had to say. You ain't had to say nothing else. I stand with Mika. Shit, like, g give me something other than fucking silence. Don't call me later. Don't send me no fucking text message after the fucking fact. Hold me down in real fucking time. And you know what I'm saying wasn't even out of place. If you're gonna have a con if you're gonna have a conversation about historic preservation in fucking Charleston, in a place that led the nation in gentrification, in North Charleston, in a place ravaged by white supremacist practices from the police down to the next de developer, if you're gonna have a conversation and you're gonna center a plantation owner. You better be ready for a black person to ask a tough question about, hey, how about some other voices talk about historic preservation and details and aesthetics and architecture and shit like that? Have my back in real time. 
I'm 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 done with it. And and for all y'all who send me the DMs about oh your your, your favorite bar uh, uh owner says some gross shit. Oh uh, your your favorite uh you know oh, oh I caught wind of this guy in, in in the upstate he used to live in Charleston. For all y'all sending me DMs about white people behaving badly, what did you do? What did you do? What did you say? Who did you organize? How many moms did you organize? How many neighbors did you organize? How are you withdrawing your support from that business? How are you being public with your condemnation? Don't come to me. Don't come to me and ask me. Don't tag me in this shit. I, I, I'm out. I'm completely out. You're going to get you're going to get this from me verbatim. I'm going to cut and paste this. I'm going to put this in the Google Doc and cut and paste this response. You send me something about somebody, a white person behaving badly. I'm going to be like, oh, for real? What? That's crazy. What did you do? How did you respond? I'm literally going to hit you with that. Because I know how y'all do. Because I, I bet you about 30 to 40% of the people in those room attended somebody's REI or DEI. And then when you get to that practical, practical application of what you learned, y'all don't do shit. I'm up here feeling literal body pains and spasms because I know I'm the only voice brave enough. And I'm not saying, again, not trying to be a martyr, not trying to be sanctimonious, but I was the only one brave enough to raise that objection in real time and literally crickets, devastating silence. And I was disappointed and I was, I was, I was angry. I'm still angry, but more importantly, I learned uh, again, I guess how many times I got to learn this lesson again, y'all don't do shit. When white people are left up to their own devices in rooms and y'all can take this how y'all want to take it too. Um, you could be either, you could, you could take it as, as, as personally as you want or, or not. Right. Or you, you could let it fly. But when y'all in these rooms, y'all don't do shit. Y'all don't challenge no systems. Y'all don't say shit to nobody unless, unless it's about like some really like offensive, like sexual harassment shit. Y'all don't say shit. Y'all definitely don't give a fuck about black women. Y'all don't stand in solidarity, black women, nothing. And then you might say, well, Mika, did you expect that from that room? I expected humanity in that room. It's time. It's time to raise the bar. In a post Dylan Roof, Charleston, in a post-2020 summer, Charleston, it's time to fucking raise the bar. I expected humanity. I didn't lift up. I didn't say, well, why don't you have drive? I didn't bring up something completely unrelated. I talked about, I, I referenced the growth, the rampant growth and how it's displacing scores and scores of people, poor and brown and black people. That's not out of place. I didn't say something like, I didn't, I didn't talk about the weather. I, I wasn't talking about, I, I, I kept it specific to what they, you said it was a lively conversation, a lively conversation, fresh approaches to historic preservation. You got a plantation owner on the panel. I'm going to talk about black shit. If you're going to, if you're going to center a plantation owner, why can't I talk about black or black or class issues? Right? So no long, no longer. I'm not, I'm not mercenary meek. I'm not mer- you, you don't no more tagging me in shit. If it ain't my business, I'm sorry. Unless I feel compelled from some really, really basic position. What? For real? That's crazy. Damn. What did you do? How did you respond? How did you organize? Y'all expect black people to come in here, especially black women. Right? Y'all expect us to come in here and clean up these messes and be the loudest one. And it ain't brave. What I did was I asked a brave question, but it really wasn't brave. It was like, well, damn, nobody else going to say something. I guess I need to model it. So somebody can do it next time, hopefully. But I was very disappointed. I was extraordinarily disappointed. And not just, like, very disappointed. Right? Very disappointed. Especially people who knew me in that room. Who came up to me and was like, aren't you me? Especially y'all. I'm, I'm really disappointed. I'm not no mercenary. Y'all need to divest from black women's labor because y'all not entitled to it. And maybe, uh, not maybe, a lot of it is my fault. Right? What you permit, you promote, right? But what are we supposed to do? We supposed to be the brave ones? Y'all not going to turn me into Jackie Robinson. I don't, when I say that, I don't know if people, that lands with people. Jackie Robinson died at 55, a full head of gray hair, blind with diabetes, fought his whole life. 
Fought his whole life. Y'all, y'all getting the whole whitewash. Oh, he went into the major leagues and he integrated. Fought his whole life. Busted people's teeth out. Was fighting, literally fighting physically and along race lines his whole life. And that shit killed him. You're not going to do that shit to me. You're not, you're not going to put me in no early grave. No. No. Out here. No. So this is how, and I just want y'all, I, I know we, and, white, and black people know this. People of color know this. This is how white people act in rooms when ain't nobody else in it, when there ain't no diversity. Y'all like that shit. So y'all can hide. And, and, you know, you can have these professed values, but you never practice that shit. And that's the last time I'm ever going to stick my neck, like, not stick my neck out, because that's the wrong way. I was invited for this point to, to, to say what I said, yes, to some degree. But the indifference, I guess I just didn't anticipate how brutal the, si- the, the silence would be. Um and um, it's complicated. And if my friends who are offended by this, we can talk. I expected more from people I was, I, I'm, I'm in community with. But y'all expect me to show up and, and throw flames, but, but there's no expectation that y'all do the same and on some degree. No one said I had to stage it. You don't have to stage a, a, a walkout. You don't have to try to unionize Urban, even though that wouldn't be bad. You know, you don't have to do that shit. But what I, I expect you to do is like, I, I, yes, good question. Here, here. Good question. That's it. Joy, you said it pisses me off. The people still want to use black women's voices. Right, right. And this is what, when I had that whole conversation, and I'm going to end it here. When I had that whole conversation about um, the wellness community, that's my biggest prop, like, problem with them. Like, you got all these international yogis here. Right, talking about putting up black squares and look, trust black women and sharing a black a black one, like yeah. But but when I'm, I'm like literally here in Charleston, what the fuck are you doing, other than just projecting what you want people to think about your values? I see how y'all move by y'all by yourself. Yeah, so that's why. And I, and I, and thank you, Joni, for that comment. Right, live for people that care about you. I'm gonna live long as possible. I buried two siblings, y'all. Buried two siblings in their early 40s. I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm trying to be here. I'm trying to be here. I'm trying to have a family. I'm trying to get married. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do things. Not get married. Ugh, ugh. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do things. <laughs> I'm trying to do things. And I, I'm trying to live my life and have fun. And, and this live stream is fun. But um, I'll never again, never put myself, not willingly, not knowingly put myself in that situation to where I got to do that kind of heavy lifting in a room. Again, not trying to sound like a martyr, but like, Somebody should have said something. Y'all know who Winslow Hasty is. Like, this ain't no secret. Maybe you don't know about Michael Phillips, but you know who Winslow Hasty is. And you see an all-white panel talking about historic preservation. And it's a white, a white moderator, right? And she ran up to me, um, you know, uh, very, very regretful, like, very sorrowful. Um, very, I, and I think, I think she was sincerely apologetic about the makeup of the thing. And then I hear from Julie, Julie tried to get, I'll give this, I have to give Julie credit. She said she tried to get some more voices involved and it got shut down. That's another problem. So you didn't want a voice from native voice from that area to talk about anything. That's another problem. So when do you, but anyway, so, 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 so there were, there was like a modicum of effort made to, change that event but um i was very disappointed and this is how y'all this is how y'all do when ain't nobody watching we know but we know i'm the descendant of the enslaved i'm the daughter of jim crow refugees we know we talk black people talk we ear hustle when y'all think we vacuuming or shit like that we listening we listening so we already know this but this just this was really um look at and look, look oh I'm, I'm, let me switch it up real quick before i bounce before i bounce like I just I just noticed this right invitation is non transferable, so like I you can't like you can't give it to somebody else. So I appreciated being Trojan horse again. I just I'll never do that again unless it's something that I'm really invested in, or um, I'll never do the I'll never do the hasty the hasty I'll never do the the heavy lifting um, that I had to do in this room. Very disappointed. I'll give my again give Michael Phillips some 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 credit. He came up to me directly. Dave ran, um, probably had piss running down his leg. He probably was mad. I, I probably probably was upset. How dare the help talk? Um, <laughs> um, and I know people going to say, that's not fair. I know Dave. He's cool. I know some of you going to tell me that. I'm sure he's cool to you. I'm sure he's good to you. Um, 
Yeah, Winslow is like, please, please. All right, that's it. Um, it was tough though. I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm my bad, my bad. I processed a lot of what I was thinking about yesterday, and um, I sat with the profound loneliness. Um, I, I leaned on some folks. I cried on some shoulders. And um, I, I want y'all to also, this is, the more, this is the most important thing I need y'all to understand. What I do is not easy. I swear to God, what I do is not easy. And I'm not talking about produ producing this. Yeah, there's rigorous, there's rigor, rigorous work involved with producing this thing every, every morning um, starting at 8. But I start my day at 4.30, 5 o'clock. Yeah, but it's not easy to be this voice in this body in this city. Um, and to not have a course outside of a big rally or something to not have the support uh, of more people is lonesome and it's, um, it's painful. And I literally felt like I was having a heart attack or something. I almost passed out. And I, I remember holding myself, like engaging my core because I did not want to fall and I should never, ever have to feel that way. In a, in, a, in a supposed place that's blue or purple and shit like that. I shouldn't have to feel that type of immense pain and loneliness in a room of people um, who supposedly give a fuck about community building or whatever the fuck they put in that program. Um, this shit is not easy. Saying what I say has consequences. Saying what I say has... Like, almost every day I'm met with a consequence of what I said. Almost every day I have a conversation with somebody who talks about, oh, you curse. Oh, well, you, you know, you put this person on blast. Oh, well, you know, I, every day I got to hear what Mika Dunn did now. Right? Every day. It's not easy. The withdrawal of jobs and the, the non-consideration of jobs that I'm qualified for, the erasure in the press, it's not easy. It's not Please don't ever, ever, ever think that it's easy for anybody. Thank y'all for, um, yeah, um, Joy, Joy, I, I'm going to start. If I, like, seriously, and, and I want to say this to Fletcher, too. I hope if he's listening, if you're watching later, he's probably not. He's probably busy working. But, like, keep doing that. Like, keep bringing people in there. But there needs to be, like, a level of care there. Um, and I do believe, I think it's fair to say that I expect the people I'm in community with to stand up in real time and say shit right there. Crickets, crickets, but keep, uh, I, I appreciate being invited in. I knew my very presence was disruptive. So I knew that it's, I'm literally the only dark skinned, un, unambiguously black person in the room. Right. Like, so that was disruptive in a sea of, of floor print dresses and, and suede booties. You know, here I am, you know, uh, with a denim jacket and, and a jam sport and beautiful hair and makeup. But like, you know, here I am you know, saying the thing in this space. Yeah, Joy, you, you definitely, there's some ride or dies in here. Yeah. Anyway, I just want to say that um, it was a great week, great week of interviews. Thank y'all for your constructive feedback behind the scenes, uh, in the chat. Thank you so much. The viewership is doing great. Um, is we're making strides, y'all. I know I talk about all the time of what I need, but what I got is y'all. This community we're starting is a real one. Y'all are committed. I mean that. This is not just me trying to be neat and wrap it up with a bow. Y'all have held me down this week. I think that's one thing I look forward to was coming here and sharing this little story with y'all. Um, it, it's cathartic to do that. Twitch is really good. I get I get feedback. I don't get the silence <laughs> that I was assaulted with yesterday. Um. And then when y'all disagree with me, we, we do it in the, we talk about it in a constructive way. I've disagreed with, 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 with like a number of y'all. We've had conversations. I don't want to put nobody on blast. We've had conversations, but I like that. Hold me accountable. Hold me accountable. And hopefully we'll model something that other people can, can, can cut and paste because I really want to start like, seriously, the bar is too fucking low for white people in Charleston. Y'all got to do more and it don't have to be in no rally. Don't have to be public. Do more. Just literally one person saying, you go, you go, girl. Just one person. I would, I would allow that. I would have allowed that cultural appropriation and use of black, black idioms or something like that. I would have allowed it because I would have felt better. I would have felt better. I would have felt better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, y'all got to do better. White people got to do better. And I see how y'all act. We see. We know how y'all act. We knew. But seeing it. Because honestly, this is going to sound weird. I'm, I'm really going to dip. This is going to sound weird. While I was the only black woman in the, in the room, 
And while I do, I do maintain that my presence was disruptive because I was not on the e-invite list. <laughs> um, I still was just part of the furniture. If you get what I'm saying? Like I still was just, I was just one chocolate chip in a, in a whole like bowl of milk. Right. Like I, I still was just furniture. I wasn't supposed to be animated and come to life and say anything. Right. Right. I was, I was, I was supposed to be the furniture. Right. And so, um, you can tell that because no one, usually when I'm in a space, sometimes if people don't even rock with me, they acknowledge my presence by changing the course of the conversation. Like seriously, like and I'm not, this is not a brag, but it's just real. Sometimes if I sit and then we sat front row yesterday, if I sit front row and I make eye contact with each panelist or make faces, panelists will either subtly or like call out like, Hey, I see your face, man, Mika. We know how you feel. Like I, I so usually people will acknowledge, okay, Mika's here, L you know, Okay, what we might need to let's let's play some let's play some um some defense that's offense. Let's go ahead and just broach the topic. I've I've changed spaces that way, and that's not a brag. That's just real. And yesterday was like, nope, we going all in. Black woman in front. They probably didn't know who I was. Black woman in front. Nope, don't matter. We're not going to change anything. We're going to we're going to keep talking this white talk. I'm going to want to have no like the, the the way this panel was constructed had lack. It was like done with no irony. I'm like I thought it was a joke. You're going to center a developer. A local CEO, I get that maybe, but a developer and a, and a, and a, and a plantation owner, you're going to center them in a the conversation about historic preservation and community building? Get the fuck out of here. All right, that's it. I appreciate y'all for holding me down. Meet me here Monday. Meet me here 8 o'clock sharp Monday. We'll have some fun. We're going to keep the guests coming too. New Year's going to be really good, y'all. We're coming into 2022. Lots of interviews, lots of people, like Dave said, in person, Live streaming. We're going to figure out how to do this thing logistically uh, in other spaces. We're going to figure it out. All right. I appreciate y'all. Thank you for holding me down this week. Bye. <laughs>